Look at me. Sure. I'm the captain now. Hey, everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good night. Surprise. We're on time ish. Uh, <laughs> hey, it's me. Legal Vices here. Jeff, just bringing you another Maritime Monday. And as promised, the moment you've been waiting for for a couple of months now, we have the retired afloat people here to talk to us about the Franklin Expedition in some depth. A lot more depth than we got into the last time that we did this. So we'll bring them up real quick because they're they're tired. They've had a long day sailing um, and we don't want to waste any time. So let's do the background information here real quick, get our housekeeping stuff out of the way. Uh, again, please feel free to enjoy the enjoy the show as you always do. Hit the like and subscribe button as we go along. And one thing you definitely want to go to is Retired Afloat. The link is down below. Last time that we showed their video, you guys did amazing things. You put them up over the 1,000 subscriber mark. They got a couple hundred subscribers out of this, which means uh, they're, they're making money now because of you guys. That's pretty cool. And uh, I'm happy that they agreed to come on. Like and subscribe to this video. Uh, well, like the video, subscribe to the channel, and then go over there and make sure you're subscribed to them. Again, the link's down there below. And make sure you take our like and subscribe poll. That's just a little reminder to get you to hit the like button, which triggers the uh, little algorithm that YouTube loves to loves to mess with. Uh, it's probably the lamest like and subscribe poll I've ever done because I was busy. Uh, did you simply did you remember to hit like? Did you make sure you're subscribed? Of course, Maritime Monday rocks. Yes, we'd be stranded without you. Yes, you ran out of witty things to say. And yeah, because no reason. That's a you can tell how much thought I put into that today. Uh, so, all right, anybody, feel free to uh, business as usual. Ask any questions you have. I'll try to, uh, to highlight them, and we can ask them when there's a little break in the conversation, when we take a break or whatnot. Uh, super chats again, not required, but uh, super chats will definitely it guarantees you're going to get your question or comment read and responded to. Uh, never, never, never begged for, but always, always encouraged and graciously accepted. And uh, at the end of the show, we'll talk a little bit more about the the channel subscriptions. I think we've finally broken free from the YouTube death spiral, random subscriber assassination thing that's been going on. Uh, we've we're on the upswing again. After six weeks of being in some sort of YouTube hell, we've finally broken through, I think, optimistically. So with that out of the way, let's jump straight into this. We are going to be bringing up our guests, and those of you from Australia will finally be happy to, to hear someone speaking without an accent today. So <laughs> here we are. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's the two Jeffs and the Misses. Uh, let's introduce yourselves to us. Leanne. <laughs> it's, it's Leanne and Jeff Peters. Now, tell us a little bit about yourself. You guys are living the life. We are. We, we often get, to, um, our friends often say to us, you're living the dream. But we say to them, no, we're not, because uh, we would never have dreamt that we could have a lifestyle like this. So it's it's been absolutely brilliant. Um, we retired about six and a half years ago. Um, we decided that what we would do, we'd buy a boat in England. So we bought a 12-metre fibreglass motor cruiser and we took it up to London and then we um, brought it across the English Channel to Dunkirk in France. And the idea was to cruise through the inland waterways of Europe. So for those of uh, people who don't know, all most of the rivers in Europe are connected and then interconnected by a series of man-made canals. So it's like a road network on water and you can go virtually anywhere in Europe via the, on the water buy your boat. So we've been doing that for, this is our fifth season, fourth season, fifth season, something like that. Yeah, fifth season. So the yeah. first year we, we did Belgium and then we were going to go do France and then someone said that the Netherlands is a boating paradise. So we came up to the Netherlands and then someone said that Germany's um, uh, brilliant. So we went and did Germany and then uh, COVID hit and last season we came back into the Netherlands and we're here again in the Netherlands right now. Um, and then Around about the end of September, when it starts to get too cold for us, we put the boat into hibernation or into storage here, and we continue our travels by providing lectures on cruise ships as they travel around the world. And uh, when that's that's when that started <laughs> off, you know, it just came out of the blue, um, <clears throat> and uh, it was it was you know for the first year it was a month, and then the next year was two and a half months, and then four months, and 
and now it's basically six or seven months that we do that for so it's just been wow. fantastic we only got back to our boat two weeks ago mm-hmm. and uh, we're having a great time yeah so it do do the cruise ships come looking and asking for you or, or, or do you pitch the ideas well, to them or a little bit of both a little, bit, a little bit of both yeah so initially it was me um searching out cruise ships and but now it's a case of um we do a lot of work with viking ocean cruises and uh they are very very organized and so mm. we're booked with them for basically the next two years we've got 27 cruises uh, between now and april 2025 and there's really no room for much else so um um we'll get home for a wow. back to australia for a couple of weeks but but that's really um, it. The rest of the time, we're, we're cruising around having a great time. Well, part of Australia is home for you. We used to live on the Sunshine Coast in Queensland, which is a, a beautiful area, mm. um, about halfway up the east coast of Australia. We, we, we have people here in our chat from all over Australia. So, what a, yeah, one of our Australian English sounds the coolest. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't see Alan here today. Too bad. Alan, Alan, looks like Alan might be. Alan, Alan is is one of our main moderators, and he's he's a diehard Aussie. So, all oh, right, he'll, he'll, he'll be catch it on the on the replay and probably regret it. Uh, Barbie's world says her parents uh, live in Queensland. Ah, lovely. Yeah, yeah. It's a lovely uh, place. Yeah, we've got a hay from Sydney. Hey from Sydney. <laughs> Blueberries, Aussies here too. So, you got an Aussie oh, here too. You, <laughs> you live in the hot part, part of Oz. Part of Oz. <laughs> well, I mean, put it this way, you know, our lifestyle used to be we'd walk out the back, uh, the gate uh, through a park down to the beach, and in um, in spring and fall we would uh, be in a, sh- a pair of shorts and a, a short sleeve shirt. In summer you'd be in a pair of shorts mm-hmm. and a a singlet and in winter you'd be in a pair of shorts and a long sleeve t-shirt so <laughs> it's uh, it was pretty consistent sort of temperatures and didn't have a lot of variations like you uh, a lot of places get sometimes it, you go to places where it's very very hot and very very cold mm-hmm. well Buru Berry says yeah, i'm in melbourne and it's freezing here <laughs> ah, okay ah and vermillionaire miss queensland lived on the gold coast for a bit and inland more up near ipswich, ipswich. Ah, okay yep Ooh, okay Ooh, and a Viking cruise uh, is on Viking my bucket list. list. Oh, you yeah. should do it. Yeah, it's they pay, pay attention to their guest speakers. <laughs> yeah, they run into them. Well, I mean, that's uh, that's kind of my question. How do you how do you pitch the idea to a cruise ship to get people out in the middle o- middle of the ocean and tell them horrific stories about what happens on cruise ships? <laughs> it would be a bit like watching airplane crash movies on, on an international flight. Yeah. <laughs> How do you convince you them that's a them, great you don't idea? Don't tell them beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise! So, actually, the, the, the very first, well, it was the, the very first Viking cruise. Um, they they wanted some. They asked for um, what I'd speak about, and the first one I was going to do was was called shipwrecks. And they said you can't do a talk about shipwrecks on a cruise ship. <laughs> and yeah. um, so they actually changed the title uh, to something else. I forget what it was changed to, but. Um, when I got up on stage, the background just said shipwrecks. So, <laughs> so, and then on the we, we Our did new a lecture uh, is called definitely not shipwrecks. <laughs> <laughs> but we were on a, a maiden voyage a, a few months ago on the Viking Neptune uh, out of mm. LA, and um, I didn't realize that it was. I hadn't even considered that it was a maiden voyage, and the um, the first talk oh, you was didn't. about maiden voyages gone mad. Oh, um, you didn't. So, Yes. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, this all went well. Really difficult to pitch that idea, but uh, you've done it well. So it's a. And do do you have just a standard repertoire, or are you constantly developing new new things? Or you have to keep developing new things. I've got around about yeah. um oh, twenty five or twenty six talks now, oh, wow. but they really like you to talk about the region you're cruising through. So we just came oh. through the Suez Canal, for example, and so I had to do a I did a history of the Suez Canal talk, which was you know well received. And um, but yeah, you you want to talk about the region that you're cruising uh, through, so people have an interest and connect with the the local culture and the and the history of, of that uh, that type of region. But I mean, I try to do it mostly maritime as well. And yeah, but a lot of people come up to you after after doing a talk and say, well, you know. 
have you heard about this or you've heard about that? And they give you ideas and you look that up. And, and uh, if in the first 10 minutes of researching something, you get the the wow. If I say yeah. wow about something, that means I've been interested in it. If if I don't get that, then I move on to something else. So, yeah. Well, that's what it was with the with the Batavia, which in where, where we used your video for that, too. Uh, I, I had never heard of it. Yeah. And I, I, I was... Again, I, I've had a lot. I, we were talking before about getting pressured to write a book. I was thinking, well, yeah, maybe I'll get around to it. But then after watching that, I said, if I ever write a book, that will be the first story in the book. That is well, such an amazing. We heard tale. a few years ago that Russell Crowe had purchased the film rights to Batavia, um, oh, wow. and it would have been, you know, I'm thinking about make a great movie. Um, I don't know, but that was a few years ago. So I mean. It, I hope he does something with it at some stage because it would make a fantastic movie and it has got so much yeah. hist historical significance for Australia as well. So, yeah. Uh, I, I, mean, I like when these we old to, tales. Yeah, when we went to school, I mean, we had a very British curriculum and we were always told that Captain Cook has discovered Australia. Yeah. But the Dutch were there mucking around for 150 years beforehand. So, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, that, that, was, the, that was the eye opener for me. I'd say, it yeah. was the same thing. I just... Oh, I guess I I guess my my teachers were wrong. <laughs> <laughs> this didn't give you the whole picture. <laughs> oh, hey, we, we we Alan has showed up. See, see, Alan, I told you we'd have people without accents on here eventually. <laughs> uh, we we do have a couple of people that have generously donated some super chats here. Congratulations for reaching thirty six thousand one hundred subscribers. Long may it last, onwards and upwards. Yeah, you you'll find if you decide to to pursue the YouTube thing further. Every now and then, YouTube just decides to uh, test you to, to see if you really wanted all those subscribers you had. And they'll just either freeze you or this war of attrition. You get 25 subscribers, they knock 25, they knock 30 off. You get 20, they knock 25 off just randomly. And we weathered that for six months. And we're finally, I think we've finally broken free of that little algorithm. Uh, uh, Joe Choi says, Australia sounds amazing, but the spiders would make me nope out. Oh, uh, <laughs> well, actually, we've, we've found more spiders here in the Netherlands than in Australia. I mean, they're not deadly here, but I mean, you wake up every morning, you, you're fighting your way through cobwebs to get out on deck. So it's a. Uh, um, mm. well, there's there's, there's another. Stats. You've got some stats on the. We, we keep hearing that yeah. we, we come across a lot of people, of, especially from the United States, who say, you know, we'd, we'd love to go and visit Australia, but everything there is trying to kill you. You know, the, the snakes and the sharks, the, the spiders. But um, there's basically, you know, with shark attack, shark, fatal shark attacks, there's been on average two a year for the last 50 years. There's been yeah. no fatal spider bites for the last 50 years. And, you know, you and then you, <laughs> you say to the Americans, well, you've had 50,000 gun deaths. You know, I think I know where I'm yeah. safer. You know? <laughs> it's, the, it's the drop bears we have to watch out for. Well, that's right, oh, the yeah. drop bears, yeah. <laughs> They're vicious, for real. You can see them on Google. They're yeah. vicious little bastards, yeah. those yeah. things, yeah. <laughs> And uh, so you, even the everything's trying to kill you, and even the koalas have come chlamydia. So, <laughs> uh, well, it's, we we had a couple of other, Marv White says hello, interesting people. Thank you, Marv White. <laughs> See, it's it's always nice when someone else is here. Then it, it sort of more people die crushed by vending machines. Very oh, true. No. <laughs> yeah, it's probably true. <laughs> Nicholas Starov, trial watch. Nicholas Starov is a Swedish lawyer. Uh, difference between Swedish winter and Swedish summer, how much you wear under the rain gear, right? <laughs> if anything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you you are in, uh, you, you said uh, the Netherlands right now? Yeah, yeah. So uh, um, yeah, we picked up the boat. Uh, the boat was uh, in storage here. And we picked it up uh, about two weeks ago. Uh, in the Friesland region, which is north and the area of uh, of the Netherlands. It's just absolutely stunning sort of place and um, fantastic boating. It's it's uh, very affordable, very um, very easy. There's The Netherlands is, is flat, so there's no uh, locks to go through or anything. You, there's a few yeah. bridges you have to go under or get them to raise for you or move for you, but uh, uh, it's it's just so easy and the people all speak English. It's very friendly. Everything works. It's it's brilliant. So yeah, love the Netherlands. <laughs> yeah. That that's the good part of Europe where everything works. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> and and you you guys are on your ship right now. 
Yeah, yes. that's right. Yeah. That looks like a very nice boat. We're pretty comfortable with that. Yeah, very lucky. <laughs> mm. you, you said it was 12 meters? Yeah. 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 40 feet the two for the, 40 feet for those of you who haven't adopted the metric system. So yeah. <laughs> and you you've uh it's just the two of you that man it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's nice. It's very easy. It's, yeah. it's, he, sta he stands at the wheel and I do everything else. Yeah. yeah. I'm the skipper and, and deckhand, galley slave. Um, <laughs> what, what's, your, what's your maritime background? What did you do before retirement? Was it maritime related? We didn't really or? have one. I mean, um, maritime background, zero. <laughs> well, I mean, I, was, I joined the Navy when I was 15, but only spent eight years in the Navy mm -hmm. and um, then got out and, um, all this came about when we had the opportunity to go to uh, spend two weeks on a, a boat in the Burgundy region of France. And um, um, we we loved it. I mean, it was the first time I'd ever been to Europe and, and it was a little 10 metre um, uh, fibreglass boat. And we while we were there, we met a lot of Brits and Americans and Aussies and Kiwis who spend six months on their boat. Uh, cruising around France and then six months back in um, back at home and we thought well what a fantastic retirement that would be and and yeah. we started working towards it and um, then we realized that we couldn't afford to uh, maintain a house back in Australia which is a very expensive place to live and and mm -hmm. uh, while we we're away for six months so in the end the plan was that we were going to buy the boat and uh, live on the boat for six months and then live somewhere less expensive uh, for the other six months of the year. And we chose Penang in Malaysia, where that was going to be oh, wow. our other base. And uh, and then the, the cruise ship stuff came up and we um, we haven't really been back to Penang since. We got there on a, on a cruise ship a few months ago, but only for a couple of days. And um, so we've, we've had this other nomadic lifestyle ever since, which has been wonderful. Wow. It's, yeah. How long have you been sailing? Uh, this is six years now so yeah but when we picked up the boat it was the biggest boat that i'd ever driven um and we had no idea what we were doing um, oh so it's like yeah. we bought a boat we should learn to sail it that's right yeah. <laughs> oh wow <laughs> i mean the, the first few times we went to berth the boat and we would have to ring yeah. up the uh the marina that we were going to and um I'd say my wife's heard her back. Would someone be able to come and catch a rope for us, please? And uh, <laughs> uh, and they they did. And uh, but I mean, after a while, honey, live. After a while Make you, sure uh, you live. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're only crossing the English Channel. What could possibly go wrong? Yeah. So it's, it's... <laughs> oh, that's that's fantastic. I and mean, there's a a lot of people that love to be doing what you're doing. I mean, yeah, it's, it's truly it's, truly a blessed life, I guess. It's uh, it's pretty cool. Ooh, yeah, very lucky. And if, especially if the uh, if the one six months of the year pays for the other six months of the year, I guess that's a that's a win situation. Yeah. 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 What 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 advice? And I think I know what you're going to say. Would you give it to anyone that uh, says, "Hey, I want to buy a boat. This sounds like an amazing lifestyle." Well, well, it really is. But I mean, you really have to do your research into it first. And and uh, um, I I did I don't know two years Jeez. worth of research into into boats and. Over here in Europe, there's a lot of different types of boats. You get people who live on barges, for example, and they could be 15, 20, 25 metres long, even longer sometimes. And um, I wouldn't like to handle one of those boats through the canals and things with a, a little um, a engine on the, on, on, on it the and it. Um, yeah. trying to manoeuvre through. Uh, and you've got a lot of steel boats here in, uh, in Europe as well. We chose this boat in particular because uh, I want eventually want to be able to take the boat out into the Mediterranean and cruise around the coastlines mm. of Greece and Croatia and, and things. Yeah. And we needed a, a boat that was capable of doing that. But this boat's great because it's flexible and the radar arch actually folds down and, and the windows, the, the windscreen folds down as well. So we can go yeah. from having an air draft or a height of five metres down to three metres. So... We can get under any bridges and, and things. That's that, convenient. Yeah. Mm. So it, it's it's great. It's a very flexible boat. and um, But just do your research. And, and I mean, if, if someone was looking to buy a boat in Europe, we um, we, we actually did a, a video. It's on our YouTube channel about about choosing a boat and, and what how you, how you actually go about doing that and what you expect once you're here. 
but it's it's it is it's it's not like cruising the coastlines of a country everything here is so close together i mean we came uh you know we basically left where we were this morning cruised half an hour and we're in another little beautiful little village and then we we cruised another hour and we came here to uh Lawarden. um took us a while to get into Lawarden because of all the <laughs> one of the bridges was they were doing some work on one of the bridges and it was closed so we had to go back around the long way and to come back in again but, another uh, bridge we had to go through was a railway line so we had to mm. wait for a safe time coming into it and then when we had to turn around again we had to wait going back the other way as well so, so you, you see the train coming across the the bridge that you're going to go through and then they they swing it open and you just drive through the bridge it's just yeah, it's just incredible infrastructure here yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing yeah. and that all came comes from those times of the dutch east india company back in yeah. the batavia days where the um the dutch east india company made such so much money and the dutch government made so much much money out of the taxes on the uh, on the dutch east india company so yeah, a lot of the infrastructures from, from way back mm. in those days. It's amazing. Oh, and, and as you're new here, I should tell you that any any snorting, snuffing, heavy breathing here is not coming from me. I've got two 23-kilo English bulldogs under my, my desk oh, here. Oh, <laughs> <what's going on? laughs> they, uh, Come up and say hello. They, they, they pick them up. <laughs> <laughs> Come <laughs> on, Jeff. They want to get... Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> That's Yoda. Oh, hello, darling. He looks just like you. <laughs> That's Yoda. Oh, oh. Sorry, buddy. It's your turn, strawberries. Ah, no, I, I want to play with you. I know. Oh, fuck me. Ah. Oh, ah. Ah. number two. Hello. Hello. Strawberries. Robbery. Oh, you're so sweet. Oh, God. Now you go back to sleep. <laughs> well, let's schedule the hernia appointment tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> That's the oh. only downside with um, with full-time travel. We we can't have a, a dog of our own. So yeah. we stop people in the streets every day and say, can we say hello to your dog? And we used to actually, um, before the, the cruise ship stuff became so busy, we used to do a lot of pet sitting where we'd go to someone's house while they were having a holiday and, and look after wow. their, their dogs or their animals. And that was a great experience mm. too, wasn't it? Yeah, great it was way to travel. Yeah. Yeah. Be, yeah just, they, they love people. So they've yeah. knocked the mic out of whack. There we go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> old man noise. You come and pick up a hundred pounds worth of dog and see, <laughs> see how you're doing. <laughs> And especially, was I'm, I'm trying to get less fat from COVID. I just I put on a ridiculous amount of weight during COVID, and Korea just they have only been opened up the gyms and things for several months now. So today was today was upper body strength, so that that actually took a lot of effort. <laughs> I can <laughs> barely <laughs> move. It's probably living on a, on a cruise ship for seven months and see how much weight you put on. So yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I don't have the dog cam set up because we have respectable people here. I didn't know they would be dog fanatics and dog fans. So, yeah, the, the dog cam isn't set up today. That's why I usually put on the, the dog cam at some point during the Aww. night. Uh, but, yeah, so any, any heavy breathing, snorting, snoring. Uh, yeah, <laughs> next time we have you on there, there will be the dog cam. <laughs> so the noises are coming mostly from them. Um, okay. Oh, my parents my parents have owned Great Danes. My my godmother type person, she she owned two gigantic Great Danes, uh, so I get it. <laughs> One dog weighs more than both of both of Jeff's. That would be a really large dog if it weighed even yeah. close to what they weigh. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, they're they're twenty three kilograms a piece, so they're they're like fifty pounds each. Uh, well, I guess with with, uh, with that out of the way, how about we get into the the the, the meat and bones, so to speak, of the story tonight? I, I know people are people are excited for the cannibalism aspect. Uh, we'll go we'll get there eventually, but w this is probably I can't think of a, a of a more tragic and disastrous expedition that's ever been launched in the, in the history of mankind. If there is, I don't know what it is. Yeah, it's it's um it was it was. Pretty terrible, much such a waste. And I mean, if you if you consider that, you know, the the search for the Northwest Passage was so important for for four, well, for four centuries, people were looking for the Northwest Passage, and some of the greatest adventurers in history went searching for it. And 
Uh, it was only 25 years, though, that after Franklin left that the Suez Canal yeah. opened up and the whole thing became redundant. So, yeah. And then what a was it 120 years, 140 years before they found Franklin? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it, they uh, found the ships. I, yeah. Yeah. Well, they found the ships. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 a fascinating story, it's, it's been such 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 a, a tragedy, and I, I, that's the thing that I think shocks me most about. These, we don't have generally these great, huge loss of life accidents that seem to happen quite regularly back in the day when it was all greed and and money and and uh, incompetence. It was just all about the the money, but. Well, here in Korea, we had the Sewol ferry disaster about six years ago that uh, killed 400 school children. Uh, but we, you know, we don't have them that much anymore, which I guess is a good yeah. thing. But but when we do have them, uh, it, is it the passage of time that makes the loss of three, four, five hundred people easier to talk about? It, it, I think it must be because. Um... I mean, I, I do another talk about a, a, a more recent disaster where 16 people um, were, were killed and, and I get very emotional. That only happened in 1981. And yeah. um, I get very emotional mm -hmm. about that. Um, um, so, yes, it is it is it is the passage of time. You can talk about them. I mean, you, you can't really judge. Um, it, it's hard to judge the morals of people back in those days based on 21st century morals as well. So, you know, and and back in those days, there were so many ships that were lost at sea, you know, going around Cape Horn or the Cape of Good Hope, all those yeah. sort of places. It was such a dangerous world back then. So it wasn't surprising that, that um, um, so many, you know, so many ships went to sea and so many never came back again. So, yeah. Yeah, and, and that's what I, I was referring to the to the your your recent video of the the Penley lifeboat disaster was we we covered that again uh, several months ago and I mean that was that was an emo like, an, like you said it's an emotional story yeah and, and uh, hopefully well, if you if you like what we've done here tonight we'd love to have you back to talk about that uh, in in a month yeah, or so yeah. depending on what your schedule is yep no that uh, sounds good yeah and it's I mean it's strange for me doing this. Because there's no, like it's talking about historical events. So they're historical events, so there's no modern tie to it. But I, oh. I did a, 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 I did one episode about a ship that sunk off of uh, Newfoundland, and it turned out that the ex-wife of the ship owner was watching the stream, and that that was sort of my first connection that, wow, people. People that were affected by this and influenced by this watched this. Yeah, mm. yeah. And, and then I, I did a murder trial, uh, streamed a murder trial from a, a a guy that was allegedly supposed to have stalked his ex girlfriend's new boyfriend and and murdered him. Uh, I mean, I think it was a wrongful conviction based on the evidence. But one day, someone claiming to be his sister shows up in chat. And his brother, her, his brother, someone claiming to be his brother, showed up in chat. Ran the ran the bona fides, did the check, and it turns out it was it was legit. There was three family members that were that watched the entire stream, and that sort of yeah. Yeah. cause it gives me a little bit of. And I, I warned them when I found out that it was they were legitimately them. I said we kind of we 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 take it seriously, but sometimes things are so serious we have to inject a little bit of levity in it to to, yeah. to, to keep it, but. You know, it's having this new connection to to modern people and the people involved. It's at some point, you know, someone is going to watch the Penley lifeboat video that you've put up that was involved in it, that, and you're someone's mm -hmm. going to watch some of the other videos that you've done and some of the videos I've done. We've had and, that experience already. I mean, already, I did, really. Wow. I did this story or an abbreviate because the Penley lifeboat was was basically when I first. I developed the story it was um a 20 minute talk and it was put between two other stories two, two other mm -hmm. short stories for a, a one hour talk on a cruise ship and uh it was called unknown heroes because people didn't know the story uh, especially mm -hmm. on, on on a lot of the cruises we were doing mostly americans they didn't know that those stories and um 
afterwards. And I mean, the, the Penley lifeboat story involves a, a United States Navy helicopter pilot who was on exchange to the Royal Navy at the time. And afterwards, his brother walked up to the front of the stage and introduced himself. And, oh, my God. Um, and, yeah, it was, it was just, I mean, I was emotional. He was very emotional. Um, and he, we uh, we got a copy of the video and sent that to his brother, the helicopter pilot, and he contacted me and uh, told me some more information about it. And, and he connected me with the people over in uh, in Mausel in, in, at the Penley Lifeboat the current Penley Lifeboat people. So we went to um, to Mausel in um, December last year and met all the, the lifeboat people there and met um, uh, the son who wasn't allowed to go on the rescue that night. And then in January this year, we went to um, San Francisco and we met the helicopter pilot and his oh, wife man. and his brother and his wife. We spent four days with them and it was absolutely wonderful beautiful people and hopefully they'll be friends for life so um yeah i'd, I'd wow. like to tell you all about it at some stage and it, it was just out of the blue you had no idea he, that the brother was in the audience I mean, it, it sliding was... door things where it's just for no yeah. explained reason whatsoever it just happened yeah i mean even to the Sounds point like somebody where... needed to be there yeah. yeah, even to the point where I don't usually do that talk because I do get too emotional about it during, and I mm -hmm. so I don't like doing it or I didn't like doing it. And I don't know why I chose to do it on that cruise on that day. Um, I, there was no yeah. reason to do it. It was just thought, okay, well, I'll do this this talk about unknown heroes and, and he happened to be in the audience. So just um, amazing coincidence, yeah. Wow, I'm I'm personally really looking forward to it. Sometime in the next three or four weeks, uh, I'm I'm going to have a guest who is a retired Coast Guard lieutenant commander who was a helicopter rescue mission person, so right. decorated. Uh, and I mean, I'm so looking forward to talking to him. He, it's, he's a friend of a friend, and he says he just has some of the most amazing stories. Yeah, now that'd be fantastic. Yeah, they're they're. On the one hand, insane for doing what they do, uh, but then also ridiculously heroic for putting mm -hmm. lives on the line for other people. Yeah, yeah. But they don't yeah. even know. They'll never know. That's right. It's uh, service before self. Ah, uh, man, I'm just I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Looking forward to, to this, and I'm looking forward to doing what we need need to jump into here right now. Uh, before we do that, though, uh, IWD, thank you so much for this, Super Chat here. One of the things that always surprised me about the expedition is that the Navy and Ross specifically almost seemed like they set the captains of the Erebus and Terror up for failure. Hmm. Yeah. Um, hmm. I don't know about yeah. that. I mean, I, th I think there was... Yeah. It, there was a lot of contributing factors to what happened, and, and um, uh, a lot of... A lot of what happened was because of, of new technology that was untried and untested, and, and uh, uh, it may have influenced what what actually happened in the in the in the long run. Yeah. So and yeah, a bit of a rush, maybe you know. Well, I mean, the food had a lot to do with yeah. it, and uh, yeah. the food could have was was um, uh, probably poisoned by by lead, and that yeah. would have impacted their reasoning and their thinking and everything else. So whether that had a, a you know a huge impact. We'll, you know, we'll probably never know, but yeah. Kitty says it wouldn't be a proper Maritime Monday without cannibalism. Oh, and got some for you. Says, yeah, you need to explain why we like cannibalism stories. We're not crazy. I don't know why you guys like cannibalism <laughs> stories, to be honest, uh, but uh, it always seems to be to be a hit. Uh, doing, doing the mignonette and other, other things, the Essex uh, sort of seem to strike a chord with people, but I guess, I, I guess that's a, uh, that's the, the 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 most extreme situation you can be in. Uh, yeah. And what I what I what I like to do is is to con contrast the Franklin expedition with the Shackleton expedition, and how you, I mean, how you can get someone like Shackleton for on floating ice, lost in the middle of nowhere, takes his voyage out in a handmade boat, sails eight hundred miles through three storms to get where he's going, and at the end of the day, can say not a single person was lost yeah. Yeah. after two two and a half years on the ice. Uh, yeah. It's amazing. 
that's I mean that voyage to me in that uh, in that long boat, the James Craig, um, was probably the greatest bit of navigation in history. I, I just can't see how that could possibly be surpassed in um, in any way. And, and um, yeah, they just, were navigating with a pocket watch, if I recall. Yeah, dead reckoning. I mean, yep. um, absolutely. I mean, they couldn't see the sun because of, of the, the um, storms. Yeah, yeah, it's just incredible. So I think they took two or three um, sightings over the over the that whole voyage. So yeah. just an amazing they could you know pick out a speck in the in the in a huge ocean like that. Just amazing. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, this the story we're telling today is unfortunately kind of the exact opposite of that. And uh, before we get going, Night Owl says, I'm Australian. You can't fake an Australian New Zealand accent. Just saying. <laughs> What's he saying? I've got a New Zealand accent. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's just saying we don't we, we can't fake them because because you know, Americans love to try right. to impersonate yes, other yes. accents. Okay. Um, okay, well, let's let's bring the video. And like I said, just anytime you have anything to add, anything to say, just please jump in, and uh, I'll I'll ask questions, and I'm sure people will have questions as we as we go along as well. Uh, not crazy, says Soul and the Witch. I just enjoy high seas cuisine. Oh, <laughs> <That's okay. clears throat> Enough with the cannibalism, people. We, we have respect. We want these people to come back. We actually, we actually had to give a talk once. We were on a we we're on a cruise ship that was on a world cruise, and um, um, every thirty days you had to do a, a new lifeboat drill. And the cruise director came mm. and saw me and said, you know, "People are, are upset. They've got to do a lifeboat drill every thirty days. They're, they're not taking it seriously. Can you do a talk about mm. the the reasons behind it and and um, the the mm. need for for lifeboat drills and." So I thought, okay, and I, I got up and I, I started talking about safety of life at sea, solace and all that sort of thing and about how that came in after the Titanic disaster. And mm -hmm. um, I, I said, and, and I said, you know, I really in, actually enjoy lifeboat drills. And I was only kidding. And I, and I said, I enjoy it because I look around and I think, okay, well, in the highly unlikely event of the ship going down, and even the more highly unlikely event that our life raft is drifting around for weeks and weeks and or we're stuck on a deserted island, who's the first person we're going to sacrifice for food? And uh, we had a guy on, a, on in our lifeboat that was a, um, he was a vegetarian. So I said, it's, it's obviously Robin. We would have sacrificed Robin. <laughs> he's, a, he's an honorable man. He's a vegetarian. He'd never eat our flesh. So he's the obvious candidate, isn't he? Yep. And, and uh, <laughs> the people started coming up with Robin recipes, and uh, uh, That's we, could have, we could have had a, a cookbook that we could have left in the um, in the lifeboat. So if anything did happen, <laughs> we had, we had our, our recipes all set. Mm. That's brilliant. <laughs> and Robin appreciated it. He took it in the right light. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Well, you'll fit in. You'll fit in just perfectly around here, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Oh gosh, I was going to make a, a minion at poor Richard Parker joke, but it uh, wouldn't be appropriate. Um, let's see. Bring up. Let's bring up the Lost Franklin Expedition video. And this was this was done in 2020. It looks like the it's a revised version. I, I, you, you were saying that you'd had a longer version, but uh, they you, they had you trim it down for for time and entertainment purposes. Yeah, well, originally when we started doing the cruise ship um, uh, lectures, it was they went for an hour, but they've mostly been cut down now to forty-five minutes. So there was a little bit I had to um, to cut out of, of this talk. I think, uh, not sure how long this one goes for. Uh, Fifty-two the, minutes, it looks like. Yeah, I probably went overtime on it, so yeah, probably got in <laughs> trouble for that. <laughs> well, just uh, feel free to add anything. We'll stop, and again, if we have questions, we'll. We'll uh, line them up a little bit and and go for it. Um, let's see. Just so you know, currently we have 332 people watching. 351 people watching us now. So that's a we're getting up there. That's about where we are. We usually hit around 400, as I was telling you beforehand. So, all right, everybody, let's sit back and and watch this and let's learn more about the Lost Franklin Expedition. Combine some history with mystery and talk about the Lost Franklin Expedition. So. Ever since the um, Marco Polo ventured to the east and discovered the riches of the Far East, men had always wanted to find a faster, more secure way of getting there. 
you know, the only sea route available to Europeans was to either travel down the Atlantic and uh, around Cape Horn uh, at the bottom of South America or around the the Cape of Good Hope at the bottom of South. Well, and this this is I, I love your use of maps with this. Uh, this is I mean, this is one thing that is so helpful because we just hear place names and we don't really get to see the logistics. It, it, it was one thing that I'd mentioned before about the opium wars, how you, you get offended somewhere in China. You've got to sail all the way around Africa, all the way up to England. You have to explain to someone what happened 18 months ago while you were trying to get back home, how you were offended. Then they have to raise armies. They have to march them across the Silk Road for however many years that takes and then get the other army to go back. So by the time you you say, all right, we're ready to start the war, five years have passed. And you're over it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, to get anywhere, you had to go all the way around in two of the most dangerous capes on earth, <laughs> the Cape yeah. of Good Hope yeah. and Cape Horn. And why, why is it so dangerous to go around those capes? Because of the winds and I mean the, the converging winds on both of those capes are very, very dangerous. So um, the, the Atlantic hitting the, the Pacific and the Indian Oceans, um, it just makes for, for huge seas and, and strong winds um, just rollicking around there. And I don't know, I mean, hundreds of ships have been lost on both of those capes. So um, very, very dangerous part of the world. And... I mean, the introduction of the Suez Canal. I mean, that was such, and I mean, and that was right. the reason for searching for the Northwest Passage because you would get away from that and have a much safer, uh, secure route through to to Asia from from um, from Europe. And so it was for four hundred years, people were looking for for that uh, much safer route. And any time that the Sort of like in the name, any place is called Cape of Good Hope uh, rather than Cape of Easy Passage is going to tell you that, that you're risking something by going that way. But that was the well, only way they had. Bartholomew Diaz, Bartholomew Diaz, the Portuguese, he uh, he actually named it Cape of Storms originally, but he got back to uh, to Portugal, and the king the king thought that was a little bit negative, so the king changed it to the Cape of Good Hope, and. Um, uh, only a few years later, uh, Bartholomew Diaz died uh, trying to go around the Cape of Good Hope where he sh when his ship was sunk. So, and and everyone on board was lost. So, um, yeah, it, uh, he had the right idea in the first place. Well, <laughs> that's, that's tragic. It, it is. is. I mean, uh, I hate to say I told you, mean, you, you so. You wonder but... whether he's. You wonder whether he was, uh, as his last thought as he was going under for the third time was, well, I told you so. Yes, yeah. Uh, well, back, back to the Northwest Passage here. Africa. And both of these routes posed numerous problems. Uh, of course, the weather at the bottom, at, um, the, uh, at the, both of these capes uh, was always severe and was, it was tricky to get around. Um, there was also pirates in the region. And the, the length of the journey meant that often crews were subject to illnesses like scurvy and typhoid and yellow fever and things. So that journey was, was very, very difficult. So for a long, long time, men, including great explorers like Frobisher and Parry and, and James Cook and La Perouse and dozens of other men, searched for a route uh, through what was known as the Northwest Passage to no avail. Now, the Northwest Passage was a mythical place. It was thought that people could get through this area and get uh, all the way across to the Pacific. Now, if that was possible, uh, it would be a huge bonanza for the country that discovered it. It would take about 6,500 nautical miles off the journey, which would mean months and months at sea. So an economic stimulus to the country that found it would be enormous. And Sir John Barrow... Uh, he was the man who was the second secretary of the Admiralty for 40 years from 1804. And he's the man that is seen by most uh, historians as being the person most responsible for the build-up uh, of the British Navy into the greatest Navy of its time. And uh, he was responsible for innovations in uh, ship design, uh, armaments, um, he made sure that there was uniform training right across the Royal Navy so someone could go from one ship and go to another position on another ship and he'd know exactly what to do. He was also responsible for making sure that promotions were based on merit and not on people's connections. And so he was very influential. And uh, he, had, uh, he was responsible for fighting the battles against Napoleon, 
uh, and then he'd fought the uh, War of 1812 against the Americans, and then he'd also fought wars against the Dutch and uh, uh, reduced their power as a great naval nation. And But now uh, these wars were done, and it was the era of discovery, the era of exp exploration. And his greatest, his crowning glory was planned to be uh, before his retirement, he wanted to discover a way through the Northwest Passage. And to do that, he decided to create the, uh, the best, the biggest, the most scientifically advanced, the best resourced uh, mission of all time to go through and discover that passage. And he had all the weapons at his disposal by this time. But to do it, he also had to have the right person to be in charge. And um, But just to before we get there, I'll just show you that but this is uh, the area that we're talking about, above Canada uh, and um, before we get to the Arctic. And each winter, the ice would flow down from the Arctic and block all those channels and those passages. But it was believed that in summer, when the ice uh, thawed, there would be a passage and you would be able to get their way through. Now, that, that, was the, that was the belief. Where did that belief stem from, do you know? <laughs> it, was, it was mostly legend. I mean... It was there was a, there was a few, analog, a few hints though because I mean there were, there was things like a, a whaler, an American whaling vessel found a um, a spear in a whale that had come that was in the in the Pacific that um, that spear had come or a harpoon had been mm. uh, embedded in the whale on the Atlantic side. They knew that the company, the whaling company, and they knew of that spear. So there was things like that, and there was there was. Um, other things that had floated through to the, the Pacific side or from uh, that were, were seen as evidence that there may be a, a passage through or that there would be a, a passage through. But certainly, you know, during winter when that, that ice, you know, crushes into the Canadian coastline, you wouldn't get through. But as that ice retreats up again to the north towards the Arctic, there was thought that there must be a, a way through there. And uh, as I said, for 400 years, people went, went searching for it to no avail, both from the Pacific side and from the Atlantic side. JT Bucks says, if the Indian were smart, they'd say, hell yeah, there's Northwest Passage. Go find it. Leave us alone. <laughs> <clears throat> well, so, so it was more than just, well, it must be ice, so therefore it must thaw at some point. There, there were the legends and rumors that it existed. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. th there was some, a little... Of, anecdotal evidence that uh but not much but i mean it was it was more hope than anything else so yeah all right so as i said barrow wanted to select the best person for the the job to lead this this great mission that he was going to undertake he knew exactly who he wanted um, but before he could offer the position to that man he had to go through some protocols because um, the greatest Arctic explorer of his generation, a man by the name of Sir William Edward Parry, um, was first in line. You had to offer it to him first as a matter of courtesy. Uh, Parry was, uh, uh, as I said, a great Arctic explorer. He'd gone on several missions to the Arctic. Uh, in 1827, he, uh, his expedition to try to get to the North Pole got furthest north than any other person had ever done before, and that record stood for over 50 years. But he was 60 years old now, um, and he, his exploring days were over. But as a courtesy, as I said, uh, he was offered the role, and as expected, he turned it down. He declined. So then that um, gave um, the opportunity to offer the job to the man that he really wanted to, to take on this mission, and that was Sir James Clark Ross. Now, he was your quintessential hero. He was um, a handsome, charismatic man, uh, very courageous, he well, has been on, certainly looks like on four missions to the Arctic with Parry. Uh, he'd also been on missions to the Arctic with his uncle, Sir John Ross. And most recently, he'd um, travelled to, he'd been the leader of an expedition to the other end of the world, to the Antarctic, with two ships, the, um, the Erebus and the Terra. And this had been an extraordinary ex expedition, and they discovered a lot of things. He, um, he named Mount Erebus the southernmost volcano, active volcano in the world after one of his ships, and he also named Mount Terra after the other ship. And I and was not aware turn, of that until I heard this. Uh, the Ross Sea, which is just to the south of us right now, 
uh, Ross Island, which is also to the south, and the Great Ross Ice Shelf in Antarctica is named in his honour. But, um, but he had a bit of a dilemma. Um, he had just married this uh, stunningly beautiful woman, and he'd promised her that he wouldn't embark on any more expeditions. And so when he was offered this role, he had a dilemma that he had to face. You know, do I go away with these smelly men uh, on this small boat for two, three, four years, or do I stay home with my beautiful wife, raise a family, and be the darling of the London society that I am? So, you know, what do you do? You have to weigh that up, don't you? <laughs> so in the end, he uh, uh, and he declined the offer as well. So, but he recommended his very best friend, uh, the man that he thought would be perfect for the mission, a man by the name of Francis Crozier. Crozier had been uh, on missions with Par uh, Parry, and uh, Crozier had also been uh, the captain of the Erebus when he had gone to Antarctica. So he was... Well, and I guess I, you, I see people joking about, you know, that's some dilemma and whatnot, but I would imagine that was actually a real major dilemma for, for it, Sir James. It, it would have been. I mean, Sir James Clark Ross was just, as I said, your quintessential hero. And um, he was, I think, 43 when he declined the offer of, of that mm. uh, of that mission. And, I mean, it would have been a, a huge thing because, I mean, if he had been the man that discovered the, the Northwest Passage, you know, despite of what he's he'd done in the past, there's not many people know about Sir James Clark Ross and um, the Ross Ice Shelf is named. I think there's there's more of the surface of the earth named after him than any other person in history. So it's uh, he's an amazing man. He, he could have gone even further if he was then being able to discover the Northwest Passage. But, um, yeah, beautiful young wife. Um, um, this is what happened. That were, I mean, but they were, those, back then, the, they were men. I mean, that, that's what they were born and raised and bred for was this adventure, this exploration, this finding out new things. Right. Well, we, you cut out for a bit. You're still there. Uh, I'll be right back. I'll be right back. But anyway, as I was saying, these are, these are men. That's what they, that's what they did. That was their life. As we saw, we saw that in the Shackleton expedition as well. Come back. They saw that in the Shackleton expedition where they'd gone through this these years of hell trying to survive, trying to, to live, and they eventually did it. And the first chance they got, they all went back. Uh, back. back. It was just a little, <laughs> just a little buffering thing. Uh, it, it happened. But what I was saying was, is I mean, they these 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 were men. That's what they did. They were born and bred and raised to be explorers, to be fighters, to 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 run these expeditions. That's just what you did. You you were an explorer, and you we well, saw with well, the Shackleton, they survived hell, and then they had to go fight in a war the week after they get back, and then the first chance they get, they all go back to Antarctica again. It's just yeah. what you did. Yeah, but so, man, um, you, you've got a, a beautiful young wife at home that's who's half your age, and she wants to start a family. And um, um, what do you do? <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> so I, I I imagine that uh, you. Would, that was probably actually legitimately a very tough decision for him. Well, it probably was. It probably was a very difficult decision, yeah. But he made the right one. He's a very, very well-credentialed man in his own right. But the problem was, and, and like we saw with Shackleton the other day, uh, Crozier was Irish. And there was no way that the English were going to allow an Irishman to get the credit for discovering the Northwest Passage. Right. Um, I mean, uh, Barrow was was one thing about promoting on merit, um, but it was another thing having a, a, an Irishman lead an expedition of, of this immense scope and importance. So he was knocked out for that reason, and also for the fact that he was very low born. He had risen through the ranks uh, of the of the navy to get to this position. Uh, he wasn't one of the chaps. He didn't belong to the right club. So he was knocked out for that as well. And so they went through he was also, a few more I mean, people, a few yeah. more options. Um, himself, he wasn't He wasn't a confident man in his own ability. He was. He saw mm. himself as the, the perfect second in charge um, mm. 
a perfect man to organise the men, but he wasn't really into the politics and the publicity of being a, a leader himself. Um, he liked to organise things, but he didn't want to have to, to front up to the media and, and uh, speak to politicians and, and all those, you know, he didn't want the high profile that uh, a leader of an expedition of this magnitude would have. There, there, there are those that are born to be great second, second in charge, yeah. second in commands. Yeah. yeah, just that reason. So we're we're on choice number three here, who's not working out. So we're now we're moving on to the fourth choice, uh, and weren't satisfied with them, but uh, until they came across Sir John Franklin. Now, Lady Jane Franklin uh, was a very, very influential woman in the, in those times. And she had petitioned the Admiralty to, to select her husband to lead this mission. She wanted him to go down in history for his greatness. He had been born in Lincolnshire in England in 1786. He was the ninth of 12 children. His parents didn't have a television set, apparently. Uh, at the age of 14, he joined the Royal Navy. And it was only the following year, at the age of 15, that he fought at the Battle of Copenhagen along with Lord Nelson. In 1802, he, he was part of the circumnavigation of Australia along with Matthew Flinders, and that's another talk that I'll do um, after we leave Sydney. And uh, in 1805, he was a midshipman during the Battle of Trafalgar, the Great Battle, along with, again, Lord Nelson. And then in 1819, he was selected as a lieutenant to lead what was known as the Copper Mine ex um, uh, Expedition. It was a Royal Navy expedition, but it was going to be overland. It was going to start in the Baffin Bay area of Canada and go overland to the north coast of Canada and explore that north coast. So once again, uh, survey that to see whether there was a route through there for the Northwest Passage. But the mission itself was very poorly resourced. He only had three other men from the Royal Navy, and the plan was that he was going to get to Canada and recruit local trappers and uh, and hunters to be part of his team, but when he got there, and those those uh, those, those trappers and they they were essentially just French mercenaries, basically. Yeah, that's right. And the, the French had been at, at war with the English or the British for, for for decades. And when they got there, I mean, the experienced French trappers didn't want anything to do with being part of the Royal Navy, and uh, I hadn't which was essentially what they had to do. Yeah, I hadn't um, even thought of that. Huh. They um, they were going to be on Royal Navy wages, subject to Royal Navy discipline, um, and you know why would they ever help the British Navy? So yeah, well that that explains a lot of what happened later. Right now, uh, yeah. I had never even thought of that. Huh? Yeah, they they did. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, that um, explains things. When explain the mission to these men. Uh, they refused to go. The experienced trappers, the uh, mm -hmm. the ones that he really wanted weren't interested in going based on what he told them about the mission compared to what the, the British were prepared to pay for their services. So he could only recruit inexperienced men, and this was become a problem. So he set out in 1819 with 20 men to uh, go on this mission. Now, from the get-go, things were very, very tough. Um, they were supposed to average about 18 to 20 miles per day, but Franklin insisted on stopping for tea every few hours. So by the time they built fires and unpacked um, um, their equipment to make the tea and then packed it up again, uh, it, there was constant uh, delays. And um, Franklin was later said to be very unfit. And they very rarely made more than eight miles per day instead of 18 or 20. So the going was very slow. They quickly ran out of food. And the, the local trappers that they'd employed were supposed to live off the land and, and uh, hunt for game, but they didn't have that experience to do so. So uh, after a very short while, they were eating off bugs and insects and things like that. Um, they went um, further north, and eventually the, um, the, the trappers that were with them uh, decided that they had enough and they wanted to turn back. Franklin told them that you're now members of the Royal Navy. This is a Royal Navy expedition. You under the you're under the rules of the Royal Navy. If you this is considered a mutiny, if you go ahead with this, uh, you'll be hung. Um, so they had no choice. They had to keep going. So on they went, and eventually they got to the north coast of Canada, um, 
and there was supposed to be a food depot drop for them. A ship was supposed to come in from the Pacific and drop food off, but that, hadn't, that ship hadn't been able to get through the ice pack, so there was no food for them. Now, you'd think at this stage, from the desperate situation that they're in, that Franklin would say, okay, well, let's, you know, common sense, let's go back. But he didn't. He still insisted on following his orders and conducting this, this survey of the North Coast. Uh, it was a few weeks later that the, the trappers were desperately, they were, um, they were eating moss and bark to supply themselves with, with sustenance. And um, so they revolted once again. And, and in the end, Franklin had to see sense and he decided to turn around. And the return you journey was even worse too, than Jeff, the way up. Um, back in those days, I mean, if you were a Royal Navy lieutenant, there were, mm -hmm. were hundreds of lieutenants in the Royal Navy all looking for the next promotion or the next opportunity for advancement. And if you took on the, a mission like this, if you were given the opportunity of a mission like this and you failed or you just turned around when it got really hard, um, then you, you went back to the back of the line again and uh, your, your career was essentially yeah. over. So that would have had an impact on his thinking there as well. And uh, th this was the legendary uh, expedition where it is said that Sir Franklin, to survive, boiled and ate his boots. This is right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's the. I think that that was the name of his biography, wasn't it? The the man who ate his boots or something like that. There, there was a, there was lots of stories and and songs written about the man who ate his boots. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> he looks fit and well in 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 his official his official painting here. So uh, <laughs> may, there, there, there may have been some uh, liberties taken, I guess. It's Photoshop. <laughs> There, there's nothing more British than saying, okay, I know we're freezing and starving to death, but we must have our tea. That's right, yeah. <laughs> starving can just wait a minute. Up. Um, as I said, they were living on bark. Um, they, they were very rarely found any food. And of the 20 men that embarked, 11 died uh, on the return journey, mostly of starvation. Although one good odds. Man, was actually murdered, and it was believed that he was cannibalized by at least one other of the, the men in that party. Um, Franklin got so desperate that he actually ate his boots, ate his own boots on the way back. And later on, he became known as the man who ate his boots. And uh, Sorry, Charlie spoilers. Chapman, uh, growing up in England, uh, remembered that story and of the story of Franklin. And in his 1925 classic movie, The Gold Rush, it tells the story of the little tramp who goes off into the wilderness of Alaska to seek his fortune. He's freezing cold um, and he's got no food and eventually he has to cook and eat his own boots. And that was based on, on Franklin. But um, eventually they were uh, on the way back. They were discovered by a Native American uh, Indian tribe. Uh, they were given assistance. Um, they were given food and they were taken back to safety. Now, the Canadian authorities were very, very critical of Franklin and his leadership. They said he wasn't fit to lead uh, this expedition. He, had, uh, he was inflexible with carrying out his orders. He had no common sense. Uh, he, he was foolhardy in what he had done. But when he got back to England, the British government was in a fairly critical situation. There was a crisis going on, and they didn't need any more bad news. So the story was spun as being a great uh, heroic event, and he'd uh, triumphed against adversity and, and struggled through the wilderness to, uh, against all, all odds and uh, survived. So he was actually promoted to captain and later on received a knighthood uh, for his efforts. He was later appointed in 1836, appointed as Lieutenant Governor of uh, Van Diemen's Land, which we now know as Tasmania. And when we get to Hobart, you'll see some of the, the evidence of, of Franklin there. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. And then in 1845, he was appointed officer commanding the British Naval Northwest Passage Exp uh, Expedition. Now, he was 59 years old at the time, which was old for an explorer. That was, that was old back in those days, not like these days, where 60 is the new 30, isn't it? Um, Crozier had accepted the so. role as second in charge. <laughs> Um, of the expedition. He had really had no choice. He had no other employment that he could he could go to. But Frank, do you think he was truly incompetent for this voyage? No. Well, it was a strange voyage. I mean, 
he did a when he was lieutenant governor of Van Diemen's Land, he did an amazing job there. I mean, everyone in Tasmania would praise the job that he did. He uh, he had a he spent he did a lot of um, social good. So he started the very first non-denominational um, school um, there, and every he, for the very first time anywhere in the world, anyone any child could have a a free education. Didn't matter whether they were. Uh, free people, or there were the the, the, um, the children of of convict, or anyone else could have a, a free education there. And he and his wife purchased um, uh, land, which started a lot of farms in that region. Mm. He, um, he he did a lot of good in in uh, in Tasmania. The trouble was that the bureaucrats from the Commonwealth Office and the the Foreign Office in, back in uh, who didn't like him he didn't they wanted to use the money that he was using for social reforms on other things so they white answered him they stabbed him in the back with his superiors back in london and said that he was a petticoat governor and that he was taking orders from his wife and lady franklin was a lady who was very wealthy in her own right but um she was also very opinionated and uh, spoke her mind and if she wanted something you know it usually happened and it's thought that that she had more um ambition for her husband than he had for himself he mm. she wanted him to be a great man spoken in the same breath as ross and parry and cook and and people like that and, and uh, so he, he probably wasn't incompetent but yeah um i i, I probably admire the guy for 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 doing the things that he actually went out and tried to do I've, I've got a lot of time for him actually so yeah. yeah american viruses freedom said men of those days knew their life was of sacrifice and your life worth was based off your willing to die dean kovacs uh, it's such a cool idea to lecture about these stories while traveling on a cruise ship through the seas where these events actually took place that that, that I, I have to admit i am kind of jealous of you it's uh it is pretty good fun yeah uh, Night Owl says, as, a, as an Australian and regular subscriber, loving tonight's Maritime Monday with guest Jeff XOX. And Thanks, he also Owl. said, born in born Australian in the 1960s, we learned about Sir John Franklin and all explorers in high school and many other stories in 1970s education system. Oh, good. We're not we're not teaching these things these days is a problem. Because uh, it's all colonialism and you know it's a, imperialism and uh, you know white supremacy and all these bad things now and you know the civics aren't taught history isn't taught you know yeah it's, it's we are losing it's very, what is, what's the term woke um yeah yeah, yeah. Not, not really understanding about how as i said before i don't know how you can apply um 21st century morals to things that happened centuries ago and, and um right tear down statues of, of people from from bygone eras you know um i mean here in europe they don't do that i mean Vasco da Gama wasn't the nicest guy in the world. He was never going to win a, a, um, a Employer of the Year contest. He he, he killed thousands of people uh, in his in his travels. Yeah. But you know, they still got the Vasco da Gama bridge and and all the other Vasco da Gama things. And and um, in Germany, I mean, every school student in Germany has to go and visit a concentration camp to learn about the history so that it doesn't happen again. And and it's, it's pointless, you know, tearing down a statue so you don't hear about something and instead of learning from from the experience. Well, and and uh, Columbus Day is on its way out. It's on its last legs in America. But uh, Columbus's tomb is uh, quite a spectacle to behold there in Spain. So you know, it's, yeah. we, we, we kind of have a market on stupidity in America. But uh, <laughs> we don't like yeah. to get political here, but uh, I just kind of want to say that's just it's 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 unavoidable that we're losing a lot of our history and heritage to, 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 to the wokeness where you have to take people at the time, you know, the good, the bad and the ugly, because oftentimes yeah. good can come from bad. Yeah. But I mean, uh, Franklin and Crozier knew each other fairly well because on that, um, on that trip down to, um, to Antarctica, uh, Crozier and, and Ross pulled into uh, Hobart town where when Franklin was the uh, the lieutenant governor there and they spent many months there and dined with the Franklins regularly and were very good friends with the Franklins. So they did get on very well. They were good friends. And Elliot Mar Morin asks, uh, why couldn't they just fish the Copper Mine River? 
Well, I mean, the, the forest them, yeah. in, in Canada were, I mean, the forests were teeming with with um, with game, and the fishes, the, the rivers were teeming with fish, and they just didn't know how to do it. They just didn't have the skills. I mean, the only people he could hire as as uh, to go with him were people that had either had no experience in the wilderness or had tried to be in the wilderness and had failed. Um, so that's the reason. And uh, let's go, Brandon. Uh, Lincoln Kane, please go press like on his current live stream. I have no idea who Lincoln Kane is, but uh, we'll definitely look him up after uh, after we get off here. No idea who he is, but thank you so much. Let's go, Brandon. As always, deeply, deeply appreciated. Uh, just noticed Jeff is actually gaining subs. Yay, me. <laughs> just because we have awesome guests here, like, like like Jeff here, that makes me sort of look semi-smart. So I'm great. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, there's a little bit of vain glory here. When I, it's, it's, when I was a teaching assistant in, in uh, at university during my senior year, the my advisor had me teach philosophy 101 and he said uh, the secret to life is study from the best books and teach from the second best books <laughs> so i i have the best guy here and i'm just uh, i i'm one of those guys that's happy to play second fiddle to actual experts so it's uh and we've got what we got one of the leading experts on the franklin expedition right here so i'm going to use him and keep my mouth as shut as possible during all of this Let's get back to the adventure. We're just getting started. Franklin at the time was an unusual choice because he was unfit. He'd been sick for quite some time. Um, so why was he going? Um, but the authorities said he doesn't need to be uh, fit. He, um, he's always going to do his being on a ship the whole time and just sail through this passage. He doesn't need to get on the ice. doesn't need to do anything at all. So <laughs> oh, not a problem. Yeah. These two men had actually met previously when... Um, uh, Franklin was Lieutenant Governor of Tasmania, or Van Diemen's Land. Crozier had been part of that expedition, the Ross expedition down to Antarctica, and they'd stopped off in Hobart. And Crozier had met and fallen in love with the niece of Franklin, the lovely Sophia. Um, the two of them were very much in love. Uh, Crozier proposed marriage to her on at least two occasions, and uh, she declined. Even though she was madly in love with him, she declined. She wanted a husband that was going to come home to her every night, not go off to sea for weeks or months or even years at a time and be an explorer like um, she'd seen her uncle be. So uh, she later became the secretary uh, to Lady Jane Franklin for the rest of her life. She later had uh, poetry published, and a lot of those poems... Uh, talk about the the love of her life who mm. went off to sea and never returned and it's based on Crozier. Um, they were going to be given two ships, the same two ships that had been taken to the Antarctic by Ross, but these ships were going to be uh, reconfigured and redesigned. Now, HMS Terror and HMS Erebus don't seem like really, they seem like great names for warships, but don't really seem like great names for ships of discovery. Erebus is actually the name of the entrance to hell. So, and as you'll see later on, the crew of the ships probably thought that these became very appropriate names. Yeah, I, I always thought um, that that would be uh, not the most excitement. Why don't, you're, 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 you're supposed to go serve on the uh, HMS Terror and you on the Erebus. Uh, <laughs> that kind of may cause a little bit of trepidation amongst the sailors. Well, yeah. And uh, if, if you knew about... Uh, ancient um ancient uh greek uh greek, names yeah. like erebus but um but yeah i mean terra actually had a, a bit of american history um but yeah. both of these ships were, were gunnery platforms i'm not sure whether i talk about it during this talk but they're actually artillery platforms so they had to be very very sturdy so that um uh, they could have a lot of cannon on board they could be recoiling all the time and Terra was actually involved in the Battle of Baltimore during the War of 1812. And, um, and the Battle of Baltimore isn't a hugely famous battle, but it's famous because um, that's where Francis Scott Key um, uh, got the idea. Yeah. I mean, uh, they were trying to uh, get him to uh, take out Fort McHenry. And mm -hmm. uh, they had to, because of the Americans had, had sunk some ships in the shipping channel, they had to stand off at. Um, maximum range and fire on Fort McHenry. And uh, Francis Scott Key, who was aboard one of the ships, 
um, wrote about the the battle and the the star the star single banner and the rocket's red glare etc and, and um, uh, came the American national anthem and terror was involved in in that battle so yeah bit of American history for you there and I I can't remember in in this talk do you get as far as the resolute getting yes. involved okay good yeah Absolutely. I couldn't remember if it was if it was this nerd <laughs> all right well, well there'll be another American connection coming up later that's right. They, um, oh, they, and before we get going, we, we have to acknowledge Let's Go Brandon's uh, very, very generous mm -hmm. super chat. Uh, Jeff, hit the like button. Stay here. Just pop up a new tab. You you know what to do, Jeff. You you know you have to do a shot. Well, gee, a shot. Uh, we're 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 having a bit of Bowmore twelve here. We we had the we we had it here for the coronation and Bowmore Scotch being uh, King Charles this favorite scotch preferable to the 15 year i have the 12 year here uh, feel free to to enjoy coffee or imbibe or whatever it is that you do uh, but kind of have a hundred dollar shot rule here but I'll, I'll, I'll sip gently at it because it's a nice scotch how about that let's go brandon thank you so much and i've already done what i what yeah yeah, yeah. cheers thank you so much again it's very generous we're going to be reconfigured mm. like i said though we're going to have four inch um uh, steel plating put all the way around the hull of the ships to protect the ships from the ice. And in the bows of the ships, there's going to be even more steel put in there so they could uh, push through the ice. It's wonderful new innovation was going to take place on these ships. Um, for the very first time, they were going to have locomotive steam engines installed onto the ships along the propellers. Mm -hmm. So these ships would be able to be powered, not just by the wind, but by this, this new power of steam. And uh, they would be able to travel at four knots, which doesn't seem like very much at all to us. But at the time, this was brilliant because they could actually travel against the wind and against the current, and they could uh, manoeuvre, more importantly, through the ice if necessary and push against the ice. So this was an amazing uh, revelation. They're also going to have internal heating. So if the ship was stuck in the ice for, for a year, for a winter, then the crew would be very comfortable. And they'd be comfortable along with the fact that they were going to have about a thousand books each on each of these ships, a library there. So they uh, had things to do during uh, the times where they were stuck in the ice. Um, and one of the other great um, innovations that this, this mission was going to have for the very, very first time was uh, tin food. They'd invented how the, you could put food into a can and uh, preserve that and take it with them. So they were going to have three years supply of tin food so there was no need to go out onto the ice hunting for anything else or or trying to find food the food was all going to be supplied with them and they were going to take it along on this mission with them so in a and i mean you think of the, the the weight that even a thousand books would add to 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 a ship plus three years of canned food it, oh. it's, it's it's astounding i think just i mean just everything back in those days i mean even the clothing was heavy clothing and yeah. you know the 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 trunks you know you didn't take a suitcase you took a trunk yeah uh, with you and, and things just yeah so much so much extra weight onto these onto these ships and just incredible yeah an amazing sort of sort of find now these ships were initially designed to be gunnery platforms and rocket platforms and they had been designed for the war of 1812 against the united states and uh hms Terror, both of these ships had seen service in that war HMS Terror was actually involved in the Battle of Baltimore. Now, that was a fairly innocuous sort of, sort of battle. Uh, the British wanted to land troops at, in Baltimore and take the city, but the mm -hmm. city was protected. The, the Bay of Baltimore was protected by a, a Pentagon-shaped fort in Baltimore Harbour named Fort McHenry. Um, now, to approach, you had to... To, the British would have to attack Fort McHenry, uh, bombard that and take that before they could take the city of, uh, of Baltimore. The Americans were being canny. They had sunk a couple of ships in the shipping lane leading to the fort. So the British had to stand off at the, altar, the, the maximum range and fire their cannons and their rockets at Fort McHenry from this maximum range, which was very, very inaccurate. And so on, on either side, there was only a couple of casualties. So as a battle itself, it wasn't very important. But um, a young lawyer from Baltimore had been invited on board the British ships to uh, arrange a, a negotiate a prisoner exchange. And that, um, uh, that young lawyer uh, conducted the negotiations successfully. 
Then he was invited to stay aboard the British ships and dine with the senior British officers. And then he was invited, uh, read compelled, to stay on board um, the ships uh, because he did, they didn't want him to disclose the, the details of the battle that was going to take place. So he had a fairly good eye, a bird's eye view of this bombardment of Fort McHenry. Um, and that's the scene from the bombardment. And of course, the man I'm talking about um, was Francis Scott Key, who uh, wrote, went on and wrote a poem about the, um, the which he named the, the, um, the defence of Fort McHenry. And in that poem, he mentioned the rocket's red glare, uh, the Star Spangled Banner. And years later, uh, that was put, there was music put to that poem and it of course became the American National Anthem, what we know today. So a little bit of history there. And there you have it, Americans well. watching. Uh, that Francis is the history Scott of the Star Spangled Banner. Was having an affair mm. with the congressman, uh, the wife of the congressman from New York. Oh, good the to see politics never changes. And, and I shot a uh, key in broad daylight in a park uh, with dozens of witnesses around him. Uh, he was arrested and uh, put on trial. And he was the very first person in history to be acquitted on the basis of temporary insanity. So... That was, that was something there I learned new. Uh, also, in the third stanza of the poem that he wrote, uh, there's a, a line there that says, and this be our motto, in God is our trust. And, of course, that's been shortened to in God we trust, and it appears on all the, the American currency today. So the ship sailed from England on May 19th, 1845, with great fanfare. Uh, people were so excited about this mission. They couldn't wait for it to, to, to start and they couldn't wait for it to, them to come back. There was 24 officers and 110 men spread across the two ships. And if you read the newspaper articles at the time, there's no mention of if this mission, mission was going to be successful. It's all about when uh, and what would happen when they discovered the Northwest Passage, what it would mean to Britain, how long it would take to get for ships to get through to, to um, the Far East. Um, it was very, very positive stuff. The ships got to Disco Bay on the, off the coast of Greenland and the men wrote their last letters home. There was, um, and if you read through some of these letters, it's, it's pretty amazing too that they're so positive about it. There's men um, uh, talking about how, what a wonderful leader Franklin is and how motivating he is to, to work with. And there was one a letter from a young midshipman who wrote back, and he was complaining about the fact that um, he was disappointed that they, they were going to get this mission over and done with so quickly and discover the Northwest Passage so quickly that he wouldn't get to spend any time in the Arctic. He wanted to spend at least one winter in the Arctic. And he was oh. lamenting the fact that he wouldn't be able to do it. Now, on the journey over to Greenland, five men were, were found to be unsuitable for the mission and they were discharged and sent home. Uh, and then... On the 29th of July, 1845, an American whaling vessel uh, sighted the two ships, Erebus and Terror, as they headed into Baffin Bay into what was now known as the entrance to the, uh, the Northwest Passage. And the whalers later reported that the men of the ships lined the side of the ship. Uh, they were waving and they were cheering and they were singing and they looked very, very positive. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was the last time anyone saw Franklin and the 129 men aboard these two oh. ships alive. So thank you. That's uh, the end of the presentation. <laughs> no, I wouldn't do that to you. We have to find out what happened, don't we? So Lady Jane Franklin, um, she was a remarkable woman, a very, very intelligent woman, a woman who's, who was said to have had great mental activity. Uh, while her husband was the Lieutenant Governor of, of uh, Van Diemen's Land, uh, she was the most popular woman in the colonies of Australia. Uh, she did a lot of work, charity work herself, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, and she was the first woman to actually travel overland from Melbourne to Sydney. She bought 640 acres with her own... Well, she was a bit of an explorer and adventurer herself. Yeah, she was, yeah. Um, and she... Once again, she was one of these people that was trying to do the right thing, uh, thinking she was doing the right thing, um, and but may have been misguided in in um, in doing that. Um, may have bitten off more than she could chew with the sending her husband up on off on this expedition. 
And she, 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 you're going to mention here she's funded seven expeditions. So she did. She do you know how much she bankrolled of this for herself? Or no, there's no real record of that. But I mean, it would have been a, a lot of money. Um, she she did get sponsorships from from uh, people as well, but she spent her own money. And a lot of those seven expeditions that she sent out, they made some magnificent discoveries in their own right. Uh, and a lot of what we know about the Arctic or from those days were from her uh, from those expeditions looking mm. for her that she sent out looking for her husband. Oh. That's a wife. You want you, you want to keep. So we're we're looking for the husband, but we're also going to be uh, doing some stuff on the way there. That's a it's a good woman there. And I, how do you do you know her age? I can't remember. Then this was his second wife, correct? Yes, right. Yeah. So yeah. she was actually the best friend of his first wife, who died, um, and uh, uh, Franklin then married uh, Lady Jane Franklin. Okay. Money. Um, of land near in the Huon Valley near Hobart, and she gave these. She split these up into farms, and she gave this this land to local men uh, with the intention that they would farm the land and and hire other men, employ other people to, in the farm, and she encouraged them to plant apples. Now, the, a French expedition sometime earlier had planted a couple of apple trees in the region, and these had flourished, and she had seen these, so she encouraged the farmers to to grow apples. And the very first export from Tasmania was apples. They were exported to the US and to uh, New Zealand. Uh, and now Tasmania is, of course, known as the Apple Isle. Now, after about 18 months, she went to the Admiral, uh, since her husband had left aboard this mission, she went to the Admiralty and she told them she had a bad feeling. She had a premonition about uh, this things weren't going properly. And she asked the Admiralty to send a mission to search for her husband. And they just said, there's no need. There's, there's no problem. We, we, don't, we weren't expecting to hear from her for at least two or three years. They've got supplies for three years. Don't, it, you know, not a problem. Uh, but uh, as time went by, she got more and more concerned. And in the end, she actually funded seven missions, uh, expeditions of her, out of her own money to go and search for her husband over the, the next few years. And much of what we know about that region of the world right now is because Lady Franklin set these expeditions out and they gathered a lot of information about that region. Um, but uh, eventually she did a lot of work. She, she um, uh, lobbied uh, the Admiralty, she lobbied Parliament, she went to the newspapers and caused a bit of a stir. And eventually after about two and a half years, the Admiralty thought that they had to act. And this is a, a painting of a group of the most senior uh, uh, naval officers and Arctic explorers of their, of their time. And they're planning the rescue of, of Franklin and his men. Oh. And it's not a great photo, but in the background there, you can see a painting on the wall. And that's the painting of uh, Sir John Franklin himself. Oh, is that him on the left? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Now, these are the, the, the best Arctic explorers of, of that generation. And... Um, but there's one man who's not there, and that was Sir James Clark Ross. He'd already jumped onto a, a ship to go and search for his two friends, Franklin and, and Crozier himself. Um, he now had three children at home under the age of three, and the, the horrors of the Arctic were uh, didn't seem quite as bad to him these days with, uh, with three three-year-olds at home, or three three kids under the age of three at home. So he went off searching, and he wasn't able to find any any trace of of Franklin and his men. How many expeditions were launched to find him? Dozens. I mean, wow. as you'll find out in a minute, I mean, yeah. there was a, a huge reward offered. Yeah. And so lots of private expeditions, well, uh, went out searching as well, you know, whaling vessels and things like that. So there was dozens of people searching. The very first man to put his hand up and say, I want to go and search for these men. I want to see if I can find my very best friend was, uh, was Ross. Um, he, by this stage, he had, uh, his wife had given him a son and an heir. And uh, this kid was almost two years old and Ross couldn't get out of there quickly enough. If you know how he feels. Um, 
So he went searching with a, with a, uh, a flotilla of, of four <laughs> warships to search for Franklin to no avail. And then the British Admiralty put out a reward of £20,000 for anyone who came up with any information about Franklin and his ships. Now, this is the equivalent of about £10 million in today's currency. So it was a huge amount. And it meant that um, private ship owners from Britain and from the United States uh, sent ships to the area to search for Franklin. And that was the idea of it. But to, to no avail. And... The very first time we had a clue about what had happened to, to the men was in 1850. So this was um, four years after Franklin had actually, four or five years after Franklin had actually left. And they came across a very remote place called Beachy Island. And on the Beachy Island, uh, it seemed that Franklin and his ships had wintered there of the winter of 45, 46. And there was three graves there. And these were the graves of... Uh, Petty Officer to John Torrington, Royal Marine Private, Billy Brain, and Able Seaman John Hartnell. So, but it asked more questions than it answered. There was no other information about what they died from. There was no information about where Franklin intended to go after he left um, Beachy Island. There was nothing. There was no clues whatsoever. Uh, it was an another mystery. And so the search went on. But it seemed that what had happened is that they wintered here at Beachy Island, which is just above the, the sign there that says Barrow Strait, named after Barrow, John Barrow I was talking about before. And then they'd um, turn south and they'd come down through here, um, through this strait. And as they came down, the, uh, the ice followed them down. There was an early winter that year. And the ice only if... There's just so many of these expeditions where it's an early this or a late that. Yeah, just yeah. or a severe things. one. I mean, yeah, yeah, it's. I mean, in this case, they 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 suffered through yeah you know, very severe winters for the whole uh, the whole time, and, and which is part of the reason uh, for the tragedy here. Uh, I, it it I mean it, it it truly is an act of God. It's just a it's a coin toss. You just yeah, you can't yeah yeah sometimes you, you just know. can't win, can you yeah. And a special shout out to uh, Bella Stella, who's gifted 10 Legal Vices channel memberships. Thank you so much for that, Bella. If you were one of the lucky people that got one of those memberships, please give her a special super thanks. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. And where'd we go? Here we are. A few weeks after I left Beachy Island, the ice followed them down and entrapped them again uh, at the northern part of King William Island up here. Um. And once again, the men were entombed in ice for at least another winter. They tried to make the most of it. They went, um, uh, it's believed that they went out exploring and, and uh, seeing what they could find, but it was going to be another dismal sort of winter. Now, the next time that anyone found out any information about it was a man by the name of John Ray, who in 1854, so this is nine years after uh, Franklin had left, he was traveling, he was part of a mission that the Admiral had sent overland. So he was following basically the same uh, route that Franklin had taken during the Copper Mine expedition. And he got to the north uh, coast of Canada and he came across some Inuit families. And uh, they had in their possession uh, some of the possess possessions uh, that belonged to Franklin and his men. These were things like pocket watches, uh, uh, tobacco cases, uh, flasks, uh, um, military insignia, all these types of things, uh, even cutlery and plates. And some of them had um, the names of the person inscribed on the, on the item. And they're obviously from Franklin uh, and his men. And so uh, Ray... Okay, chat, here's what you wanted. <laughs> this is where it comes in. And before we get here, I, I, have you seen the, uh, the documentary series when they were doing the autopsies on the three, three men they found? Uh, no, I haven't seen that yet. No, it's it's brilliant. Uh, it, it's on YouTube. Um, okay. I watched it a couple of weeks ago. They were they were talking that uh, they'd found one of them had sustained a bullet wound from probably a a war or something he was involved in. And as as we talk about later, uh, there there were evidence. There was evidence of lead poisoning. Yeah, in all of them. So yeah. they, you know, they figured that may have contributed to their to their deaths. Uh, but there's the, 
this this right here is what we're all here for. So <laughs> they questioned the the, uh, the Inuits, and they said that there was many dead white men on King William Island. So mm. at least now they had a clue where uh, where to go, and that um, the Inuit gave evidence to to Ray about what had happened, and they said they told him that on one occasion two um, uh, Inuit hunters had come across ten or twelve white men. The white men indicated that they were very hungry and the Inuit gave them some seal meat, which they ripped apart in their hands and threw down their throats raw. Um, the white men started pointing to the, the sled dogs of the Inuits and the Inuits became very concerned and frightened, uh, worried about their dogs. So they took off. They, they ran away from these white men. And you have to remember that this was a very, very barren country. There was nothing growing there. There was hardly any food source. And these Inuits were, were just uh, managing on the margins of survival themselves. Um, there was no way. They couldn't survive without their, their sled dogs. So um, they had to run away. And there was no way that even if they wanted to, there was no way that they could uh, provide enough food to feed these 10 or 12 other men for any, any period of time. Um, the, uh, the Inuits also told, uh, gave them evidence to say that uh, on some occasions they'd come across these white men and they'd been dismembered and some of their organs had been taken out and that they came across some other scenes where um, limbs had been cut off and there was bones in cooking pots and it was assumed that they'd resorted to cannibalism. Now, that was a very delicate matter and uh, mm. Ray actually did a report giving all the evidence of the Inuits that he'd come across and he sent that report back to England uh, along with the, the note that said that his countrymen had been driven to the last resource, which was cannibalism. And when that report was released in London, it caused an absolute sensation. Um, later then the, uh, I mean, recently I read uh, in a uh, Smithsonian article that they had tested some of the bones. They, 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 they had found like evidence of broken bones and they tested them and found there was like burning on the bones and whatnot to the, where they got to the point where they were cracking the bones to try to suck the marrow out of the bones. Yeah, yeah. There was lots of uh, evidence of, of uh, scraping on the bones from knives yeah. and, and cut marks yeah. in the bones and things. But I mean, poor old John Ray. I mean, he was, a, he was actually a doctor, a Scottish doctor um, who had gone and worked for the... Um, mm -hmm the Hudson Bay Company and was probably the, the most distinguished overland Arctic explorer of his generation. And, and Lady Franklin had actually begged him in a letter to go and search for her husband. Um, and if he had, had, he went back to London with his report and uh, stood by his report. If he had just said, here's the, here's the items that I found uh, from the Inuit. Um, if he hadn't mentioned the word cannibalism, he probably would have been knighted straight away and been given mm. the entire reward money. But um, he was true to himself and he said, well, you know, this is this is what I've been told has happened. He had it actually when he came across those Inuits, he he actually had the choice of, of um, going to King William Island himself and and seeing for himself. But that would have meant that word would have taken, you know, he would have had to spend a winter there and um, uh, he would have been 18 months before any word got back to London. So he made the decision that he would just base his uh, report on what he'd been told uh, second and third hand from the Inuit. And he took that report back to to London. And as I said, if he hadn't mentioned the word cannibalism, he probably would have ended up with that uh, 20,000 pound reward money and, and uh, a knighthood to go along with it. But um, as you'll find out, that never happened. And John Gary says the, the last resource sounds a lot better than cannibalism. Yeah, well, it's, it's, a, it's a... And Spada said, I would rather have worked for Ernest Shackleton. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, Wendy H., congratulations and thank you for becoming a new member to the channel. Uh, ask if uh, if Ms. Franklin had any relation to Benjamin Franklin that we know of. No. no none at all. And oh, the, Barney Yamam says, Jeff, the Batavia presentation was great. Thanks, Barney. Appreciate it. And this is an interesting question. That uh, should should the terror be floated and taken home, or left where she lies? Your thoughts? Oh, gee, um, that's a really tough one. Um, I really think that these things should stay where they are. I mean, I'd I'd hate to see things like the Titanic raised or yeah. the uh, e even the terror and, and um, yeah, let let sleeping dogs lie and and. Um, 
On the other hand, I mean, you've got a, a, a wonderful museum in England, the Mary Rose Museum in, yeah. in, uh, in Portsmouth, where um, you learn so much. And also the um, um, another the uh, museum in, in Stockholm. The um, Yeah, with a big massive ship in it. The, uh, that's right, yeah, the, the Vasa. Yeah. Um, you, you learn so much from from having these ships available to, to see, but no, I, I'd prefer to leave them where they are. Well, I mean, that's what they did with, with Shackleton's ships. I mean, you're not even allowed to go anywhere near it, let alone right, consider yeah. raising it. Yeah. And, I mean, the, the, the video of that. I mean, now we have the technology that can go and scan literally every inch of the ship. So right. I, I don't think we need it. We, we can yeah. rebuild it. We, you know, we, we can build the models. We can have the, the 3D displays. And especially when it's you get like, things like Shackleton's ship that looks like it rolled off the factory yesterday. That's right. It looks pristine, doesn't it? Brass is still shiny, and it's, it's amazing. Lady Franklin was furious. Uh, <clears throat> she threatened libel action against anyone who published the report. Any newspaper that um, would print it, uh, she would go after with legal action, and she had the resources to do it. She also petitioned the Admiralty and, and, every, and uh, the government that Ray would not receive one penny of the reward money uh, that was entitled to him because of the allegations that he made. She couldn't believe for a second that her husband would have anything to do with cannibalism. And he never did receive any money from that, um, um, from that reward. Now, the next he actually did a few and, years and later. He received a small portion of it, yeah. Huh. I wasn't after, it was, after it was found that um, that Franklin had died before um, before these uh, these acts of cannibalism took place, uh, people relented. And uh, um, but I mean, there was a big campaign in, in England at the time. Lady Franklin uh, recruited some some people like Charles Dickens, the famous author, um, and they went after Ray and also the Inuits as well, saying that you know. These Inuits had obviously stolen these goods from Franklin and his men, and uh, they, at best they were grave robbers or body body robbers. At worst, they'd probably killed uh, Franklin and his men themselves and stolen these items. And if anyone had uh, cannibalized uh, Franklin and his men, it was probably the Inuit. And this was the sort of thing that um, Charles Dickens was saying, and and uh, he actually uh, went on record as saying that the, the whole uh, Inuit people should be exterminated. So. Oh yeah. my God! Yeah, J just just to keep everything quiet. Well, I don't know if Lady, you just don't know whether she believed it at the time, whether she believed the evidence, because at this stage there'd been no physical evidence. There was only the evidence. Yeah. There was only the the testimony, the second and third hand testimony from the Inuits at at this time. That's a it's a, it's a pretty harsh suggestion, though. <laughs> it's, it's very harsh to this yeah and wow. i mean you once again you couldn't do you couldn't say something like that these days could you no <laughs> no, no not since that one guy in europe anyway and <laughs> yeah that's right yeah. the inuit had given was largely ignored by the admiralty i mean these were were savage christmas no, carol charles dickens they had to say <laughs> anyway. they were, they were <laughs> robbing the the, um, the bodies of these men but one man did read the report, and that was a man by the name of Francis McClintock. Mm -hmm. So he knew that um, there was something happening at King William Island. So he went there in 1859, 14 years after Franklin had left uh, England. So this wasn't going to be a rescue mission anymore. It was going to be um, a recovery mission or yeah. a mission of, of uh, trying to find out what had happened. And he uncovered, he found a can of stones uh, with a flag on top. And he dug into that can of stones and he discovered in a metal box there was a note. This note had been ripped out of a book, that, uh, of an admiralty book. And uh, there was a note inscribed on it uh, across there. And the note was from, from Franklin. And it said, 28 of May, 1847, Her Majesty's ships Erebus and Terra wintered in the ice at latitude, blah, blah, blah. Having wintered at 46... Uh, seven at Beachy Island in latitude, da, da, da. Now, this was a mistake, by the way. Uh, it wasn't 46, 47. It was 45, 46. So cool. why had he made a mistake? Um, having After having ascended Wellington Channel to latitude 77 and returned by the west side of Cornwallis Island, and it was signed Sir John Franklin commanding the expedition, and it finished with all well. Mm. All well. Mm. Now, the noted 
McClintock realised that the note had obviously been dug up again um, and more had been written on the note because around well, the There's a lot of questions about this of, note as well, Jeff. Um, yeah. I mean, if why would if you were going to build a can of stones and bury a note in, in it, why would you rip a page out of a book and and write on that? Why wouldn't you just use normal paper? I mean, they had plenty of paper on on board these ships. So why would why yeah. would you do that? And how could you make such a fundamental error as getting the the year wrong, forty six, forty seven, uh, rather than forty five, forty six? Yeah. And we know it was forty five, forty six by the um, the dates on the graves at, at Beachy Island. So there was. There was people that were obviously very confused even at this stage. Yeah. So ra rather than people assuming it was a forgery or some sort of plant, it was just they were just that far gone already. Even though yeah. we're trying to be optimistic, the stiff, the stiff, uh, you know, British upper lip, all is well. Uh, there's probably still more alive than than dead at this point. So perhaps that, that's a very very broad definition of all being well. Um, very broad. Gosh, yeah. it's a. I mean, it's a fascinating insight into the, just that there was they there were survivors at this point. Oh yeah, and we're what yeah. we're what two and a half years into it at this point. Yep. yep. Of the uh, of the letter that Franklin had written was another letter written. I mean, God, can, I just can you imagine living in these conditions for two and a half, three, four, and as we're going to see later, perhaps mm -hmm. even much much longer than that, just in ice and snow continuously. Yeah. Yeah. Just, it, it's a wonder they didn't still go mad. I mean, earlier on. Well, yeah, I, I, I think their 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 judgment and everything else was severely impacted by this stage, though, even two years into it. By Crozier, which was a lot more ominous. It said, twenty fifth of April, eighteen forty eight. Her Majesty's ship Terror and Erebus were deserted on the twenty second, April, five leagues north northwest of this having been beset since September uh, 1846. The officers and crews consisting of 105 souls under the command of Captain Crozier landed here in latitude, uh, dot, dot, dot. Sir John Franklin died on the 11th of June, 1847, and the total loss by death in the expedition has been to this date nine officers and 15 men. And it was signed James Fitzjames, Captain of the Erebus, and F.R.M. Crozier, Captain and Senior Officer. And it ended with the note, and start on tomorrow, 26, for Bax Fish River. So this and, and, and that's just the last thing we know of one of the greatest explorers to live. Yeah. I mean, but even yeah. that note, once again, why would you just write on, on that note? Yeah. Why wouldn't you explain a, a lot more about it? I mean, the 25th of April, that's when they deserted the ship. I mean, that's coming up into spring and the warmer yeah. months of the year. I mean, why would you desert? I mean, were the ships in poor condition by that time? Were they sinking and what, what was happening? Um, maybe if they'd stayed a bit longer, they could have got out of the ice by that stage. We just don't know. The, these these notes just don't tell us anything. And the, the deaths of, uh, of nine officers and 15 men, I mean, why... There was only 24 officers, so why did nine of them die? I mean, why such a high ratio of, of officers compared to, to men had died? What have they died from? Yeah, exactly. There's, there's How did they die? No information in these notes. So basically, why write them? Yeah. This gave a clue as to what was happening. First of all, Franklin was dead. He, uh, he died only two weeks after writing the original note. And it also pointed out that they'd been stuck in the ice at this location for more than 18 months uh, and that they, they were going to try the Baxfish River the following day, go overland uh, 500 miles to the Baxfish River, which was, which was a huge endeavour. McClintock also and his men also discovered one of the boats, the lifeboats from one of the ships. And once again, this um, offered no clue as to what was happening. It asked more questions than it answered. The boat was pointing back towards where the ships had been. So had the men been trying to, to get back to the safety of these ships? Um, the other thing, there was two skeletons within the boat, and one was holding a rifle. And you'd think that if you were going to drag one of these very, very heavy boats all the way across the ice with you to try to survive, you would only take the bare essentials necessary for your survival, wouldn't you? 
But in this uh, boat, they discovered some very unusual items. There was cakes of scented soap. There was hairbrushes. There was slippers. There was dozens of books. Um, there was um, 40 pounds of chocolate, which proved beyond any doubt that there was no women on this expedition because that would be the first thing that would go. <laughs> and they even found um, brass curtain rods in the boat. Why? I mean, How why had they died, to, died of starvation if there was 40 pounds of chocolate there as well? It just didn't make any sense. And as I said, it asked more questions than it, than it answered. And, and I, I was watching another documentary about, this about, about a month or so ago, I think, and they said that they had, uh, I believe it was the Irish Army went and did a recreation of hauling these lifeboats across the ice. I think they said they weighed 800 pounds apiece. Yeah. Or something like that, and they they did it for one day, and they were all yeah. just wiped out after one day of doing this. And they were big, burly, strong military types. Well, I'm not sure whether it's mentioned in this talk or not, but um, but there was a a, a, um, a video on YouTube ages ago that I can't find anymore. But the Royal Canadian Mounted Police had some recruits go out and, and well, do that's a what recreation. It was the RCMP, not the Irish Army. Yeah, right. You're yeah, right. Um, I think. I think they split up into three groups to try and, and pull these these boats. And, yeah. um, I mean, they were – video showed – I don't know what's on, on here, but the video showed them, you know, being bussed out to a location, having a lovely hearty breakfast. And, I mean, these are all fit young guys who uh, haven't spent three years on a, on a ship eating, you know, canned food, and they, were, yeah. they weren't dressed in the heavy Arctic guys, you know, clothing that um that crozier and franklin and his men had um they had the, the latest in in um in modern clothing and they were harnessed up to these three boats and they um they raced each other across the ice trying to, to beat each other and the video shows that in the in the first you know few hours they're they're joking with each other and bantering and, and edging each other on and and telling jokes and they have they come to you know fishes in the ice and the things they're going to try and haul mm -hmm. these boats over them and, and everything and um and then uh they they bought some soup and, and sandwiches for lunch and off they go again and uh in the afternoon there was a couple of injuries a, a broken collarbone and a couple of broken fingers and things and um um i mean when they got back to uh, they finished at five o'clock and when they got back to where they were supposed to have dinner they were so exhausted that they were they just flaked out on the ground and, and um most of them were sleeping they did some blood tests and found that that on average i think they'd gone through i think it was eleven thousand yeah. calories 11 000 calories right and yeah. um which is just incredible amount you know triathletes don't go through that sort of thing yeah. and they'd only gone four miles in that one day and um crozier and his men had to make 500 miles so there was just no way that they were going to make and they it. were yeah and they were starving already yeah, little. I mean, yeah. where where did where were those eleven thousand calories come from? You know, that's it, exactly it right. Yeah, yeah. You, they didn't have that much food, and they, if, even if they did, they couldn't carry it. Ugh. And, and these are some scenes that were were um, printed or, or painted by men back in uh, in London once or England once they heard these stories about what had happened. And it seems, from what we know now, is that they were lost. The ships were were grounded in the ice up here at the northern end of King William Island and that they tried to make their way around the, the western part of the island. Remember, that was all iced in. So where you see the blue there, there was no blue. It was all iced in. So they were trying to pull these, these um, um, boats all the way around. And we know that by the fact that they found, uh, researchers have, have found bodies all the way along that, that route. Um, it would have been very, very hard going. Now, a few years ago, um, a group of – it was an experiment um, made. Uh, 105 recruits from the Royal Canadian – Sorry, spoiler alert. – were asked to be yeah. involved in this experiment. Um, these were all fit young men who hadn't been stuck on a ship with no exercise for three years. Um, they uh, were nutritionally very, very sound. They wore the latest in, in lightweight uh, Arctic wear, and they were – there's a YouTube video showing this, actually. It's very, very interesting. They were having a hearty breakfast, uh, all joking and laughing amongst themselves. Then they were put on a bus and taken out to where three boats 
uh, were positioned. And these were boats with the same size and the same weight as the boats that Crozier would have had to haul across the ice. And they were put, some of them were put into harnesses to pull it, and some were put behind the boats to push them, and they were told to set off and get as far as they could. And um, initially, they, they raced each other. There was a lot of joking and laughter amongst the, the, uh, all the men as they, they tried to race each other across the ice. And they came to some obstacles, like some fissures in the ice, and they had to try and haul these boats over and across these things. Uh, and then at this time, there was started to be a few injuries, and people were, were shaking their fingers when they jammed their fingers. There was a few dislocated fingers. Uh, someone broke their collarbone. There were some scratches and things like that. Um, and then they were given a bit of lunch, a very, very quick lunch, and then they were told to get on their way again. And then at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, they were told to stop and uh, get back on the bus and go back to their headquarters. And there's the scene in this YouTube video where people went back to, and they were too tired to eat their meal. There was people asleep on the floor and under the tables. People slumped beside their meals, unable to have the energy to eat. And it was estimated that each one of them had uh, used up an average of 11,000 calories that day hauling these these um, uh, boats across the ice. Now, I exercise and, and I find it hard to burn 2,000 calories in a day, let alone um, 11,000 calories. And do you know how far they got that day? Four miles. Only four miles. Crozier and his men had to go 500 miles to find the nearest blade of grass. They had to go a thousand miles to find any form of civilization. They had absolutely no chance of survival. And along the route that um, they would have had to take, as I said, there's, there's many bodies that have been found over the years. And some of these have been found in, in single uh, positions, some of them have been twos and threes, and, and some in, in more. And in some cases, they're lined up in, in rows, you know, very neatly, like they've been put into a tent, and, and someone said, you know, we'll come back for you when we get help. Uh, and then some are just slumped all over the place. And um, in some cases, they have found uh, bodies with uh, nicks in the bones, which was obviously yeah. from a knife when their, their bones had been filleted. And they did find uh, bones in, in cooking pots and things. So there certainly was um, some form of cannibalization by, by some of the men. Um, and also a number of artifacts have been found um, um, by different people, the tobacco tin, um, a military, uh, a naval... Um, a badge, uh, pocket watches and things that have been found along the way. And even uh, China that was, was taken has been found along that, that route. And then in 1981, the uh, scientists from the Canadian government were given permission to resume the bodies of the three men that were found on Beachy Island. And I'm going to put a, bit, a, a picture up here in a second which shows uh, these uh, dead men. So if anyone's offended by that, you'd need to look away. Um, but these were the, men, the Torrington, uh, Hartnell, and Billy Brain. And this is the way they were found. Um, now, they're in very, very good condition because they were frozen in the ice for all that time. And when autopsies were done on these men, they found extremely high levels of lead in their tissue. Uh, now, London was a very polluted city at that time. Yeah, the, the, the documentary with the scientists performing the autopsies is really, really fascinating to watch. Okay. And how they, how they 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 extracted them and and how they performed it, and one of them I I believe they said had already had an autopsy performed on him. Ah, oh, okay. At the time of the uh, of his death, yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is, he he. They think he died on the ship before they got there, and they'd perform some sort of autopsy. Okay. They said they, there there was something unusual. I think it was that instead of doing the the in, it had like an inverted Y incision on him there was something that was different about the autopsy it was quite a fascinating watch that time but look at this wouldn't account yeah. for the high levels of lead that was found so what had caused this now also nearby they found the tins with, with, with the food was to be put into for this expedition now the um the tins were soldered with lead solder and it seemed that these men had suffered from lead poisoning and what had happened is that the company who had been given the contract to supply um, these tin meals had never had anywhere near the size contract that this was. was. Uh, it was a massive contract for them. They had to supply um, 130 men, with very hungry men, with three meals a day for three years. So it was a massive undertaking. Um, they were given the contract on April Fool's Day. 
1845, appropriately. <laughs> Another they warning. They had six weeks to fulfill the contract before Franklin was due to sail. So they had to hire in a lot of people, unskilled people, to solder these tins and seal them. And um, these men had no experience. And, and basically the, the, um, the lead solder was painted on these cans. There was lots of lead in the system. Um, and uh, the, the way that they would uh, heat this uh, food up would be to boil some water, put the cans in the water and leave it there for five or ten minutes to heat the insides up. And it said that when this happened, the, uh, the, the lead actually melted like candle wax into the food and contaminated the food. And that's why there were such high levels of, of lead. And also the steam engine was using lead pipes throughout the, the ship. And they used some of that water in their daily diet. And that also impacted on the, uh, the amount of lead in the system. Now, the amount of lead... So the lead wasn't pipes that were used to, um, to heat the ship, so yeah. that there was pipes all around like radiators to heat the, in the internals of the ship. And um, in, a, in a couple of places, like the officers' quarters, there was a tap on there that they could use this water to shave and to make their tea. And uh, that could be the reason why such a high ratio of officers succumb uh, early on in the expedition. That's a lot of lead. Yeah. Kill these men, but it would really impact on their, their mental capacity, their thinking ability, their rational thinking. And so that's probably why some of these strange decisions had been made. It also impact on their ability to fight other diseases often, and, and, um, and that could have had an impact as well. One of the ships that um, went looking for uh, Franklin yeah. and his men, there'd been a few expeditions searching for his men, and, um, and then in the end, in uh, 1854, the Admiral decided, Admiralty decided to send their very best uh, ship, the uh, HMS Resolute. It was going to go across with a, a flotilla of four other ships and search for Franklin and his men. Um, when they got there, though, they, the Resolute got stuck in the ice, as did two of these other ships that had been sent across. Uh, the captain of the Resolute wasn't perturbed by this at all. He sent out sledding parties to see if he could find any evidence of Franklin, um, but he, he couldn't. But one of the sledding parties came across another ship, HMS Investigator, that had been trapped in the ice for two and a half years. The men on that ship were on half rations and they were virtually starving, so they were very, very happy to see the men of the Resolute. They followed the, the sledding party back to the Resolute and then the captain of the, um, uh, the Resolute wrote a report to his flotilla commander reporting what had happened, saying that they were stuck in the ice but they'd rescued these men from the investigator. The, um, the, uh, the commander, a, a Commodore Bellow, was, became very, very concerned by this. He, um, he could see disaster happening and he didn't want his name involved with this pending disaster. So he ordered the captain of the Resolute to abandon the ship uh, and travel overland back to where his two ships were and uh, head back to England. The Resolute captain protested the order um, because he thought he'd be able to make it out in the, when the, the, uh, the ice thawed in uh, the spring, but the order was, was uh, confirmed and uh, he made the ship as ship shape as he could and then he and his men started a very arduous trek across the ice uh, to uh, the other two ships. Now, 18 months later, uh, in September 1855, the Resolute was found by an American whaling vessel 1,200 miles from where uh, she'd been abandoned. Um, the American couldn't believe their luck. This was a, a ship in very good condition. There was no one on board. They could claim the salvage rights, which they did. So they, um, they sailed the ship back to Connecticut, claiming the rights, and then the United States Congress uh, decided to intervene. Um, the US had been at war with Great Britain twice in the previous 80 years, and the, uh, the US, the Congress wanted to do something to um, become friend, uh, create a better relationship with the United Kingdom. So they purchased a vessel and renovated the vessel back to its original standard at the cost of 40,000 US dollars, which was a fortune at the time. And then they, they sailed it across the Atlantic and they presented it to uh, Queen Victoria on the 13th of December, 1856. And she came down to the ship herself to ex uh, accept this wonderful gift from the American people. Um, and this was seen by most historians as the start of the special relationship between the United States and the United Kingdom. Now, 25 years later, when the Resolute was decommissioned, 
um, Queen Victoria ordered that her very, very best timbers be used to create a desk. And this desk was presented to President Rutherford B. Haynes in 1880. And of course, is the Resolute Desk, which has been in the Oval Office ever since. It's been used by most presidents of the United States ever since. So a little bit of, of more history for you. So a bit more, uh, more recent news. In September the, uh, 2014, um, researchers, Canadian researchers, found the wreck of the Erebus, exactly where the Inuit Indians had said it was. And then almost two years to the day uh, later, they found the, uh, the wreck of the terror. Once again, almost exactly where the uh, Inuit Indians had said it was. The, that advice that they'd given, that evidence that they'd given had been ignored for all those years. Um, now, the Canadian government is doing um, lots of research onto these vessels. Uh, it seems that from what they've found so far is that they became stuck in the ice at the northern end of King William Island and then they either broke free from the ice and drifted down to where they were discovered later on at these locations or they maybe someone was able to sail them down to that location before becoming stuck again. Uh, we don't know, but that's why the research is going on. Uh, the Canadians have made it uh, an area off limits to anyone else, uh, and they're just doing that, uh, that research trying to find out what, what, uh, what happened. Now, largely because of um, Lady Franklin, who wanted to preserve the memory of her husband as, as a great hero, there's been statues to him erected in his native Lincolnshire, um, in Hobart in Tasmania, in Franklin Square in, in Hobart, and of course in London. And we visited the Franklin um, Memorial in London a few months ago, and uh, the inscription says, to the great Arctic navigator and his brave companions who sacrificed their lives in completing the discovery of the Northwest Passage. Now, a little poetic license in all that, because of course uh, Franklin didn't complete the discovery of the Northwest Passage. That honour went to a, a Norwegian man uh, who some of you might know, Roald Amerson, who was famous for being the first person to reach the South Pole. He didn't, he considered, he didn't consider the South Pole his greatest achievement. He considered uh, his conquest of the Northwest Passage as his biggest achievement. And he took three years from 1903 to be able to achieve it. He didn't need to, actually. He could have done it in two years. He could have wintered in the ice for one year. Uh, but he stayed for another year on purpose. Uh, uh, in that first year when he was stuck in the ice, he went off uh, exploring and he came across a tribe of Inuits and the two parties started helping each other. And um, over that course of that time, uh, Amundsen learnt a great deal about survival in Arctic conditions from the Inuit, including the caribou fur that he's wearing here. Now, scientists have done tests on this caribou and Apparently, each individual fibre of fur holds tiny pockets of air. And now air being a great insulator, the oh. best insulator you can get. So even though this is very, very light, it's very, very warm and comfortable to wear. At the time, European explorers were wearing layer after layer after layer of clothing. So they had cotton, then they had wool, then they had canvas, and they had oil skins over the top of them. So it was very, very heavy to wear. It was very uncomfortable. Uh, it, once it was wet, it was very hard to get dry. But this caribou fur was, was fantastic, and Armisen used it for his quest of the South Pole. They also taught him how to handle dog sleds and how to make the, uh, the, the, uh, the sledding much more efficient. If you take water into your ice water into your mouth and warm it up in your mouth and then spit it onto caribou fur and rub it along the rails or the, the, um, the rails of, of the sleds, then that ices up those sleds and makes them 30% more efficient across the ice. And Armisen used this, all this information that he'd learnt from the, uh, the Inuit to conquer the South Pole on the December 14, 1911. And even though he had set off way behind Scott, he arrived at the South Pole more than a month before Scott and his ill-fated ex, uh, um, expedition. So ladies and gentlemen, that's the story of the Lost Franklin Expedition. I hope you've enjoyed that. Um, if you did, I think you'll enjoy the next talk. It's about um, the famous French um, naval officer and explorer, La Perouse, who... Wow. That was a... It's quite the presentation. <laughs> I'm glad you enjoyed it.
is it, is it odd to go back and watch yourself do these things or are you it, is, it really is i mean <laughs> hopefully i'm a lot better than that these days because that was uh f- from uh, from three years ago and and uh um yeah i've, I've done it a few more times now so uh, uh i was lots of ums and ahs there and, and pauses and things so hopefully i'm a bit better than that these yeah. days now there's there's a couple of other stories that i'd heard in relation to this uh whether or not they're true i'm not sure but the one story i believe it was the terror that the an inuit party went up there searching and they said that they had found the ship and there was four people on the ship and the the stove was still warm when they found them the body yeah, there, was, there was a story um well the, the it hasn't been obviously can't be confirmed but there was a story yeah. that came from the inuit saying that they they came across the um the terror and went on board yeah. and there were some people on board with very black faces and that could have been from uh, scurvy it could have been from frostbite it could have been from the steam engine too from the mm-hmm. coal from the from the steam engine so and they said that the, someone one of the officers told them not to go to that area over there and um it was thought that that area might have been where mm. cannibalism was being uh, carried out and and things. So, but yeah, that that story just hasn't been confirmed. Uh, it's a great story though. So, yeah, and there was another one saying that uh, another one of the one of the crewmen had been seen by Inuits walking southward ten or twelve years after the after the accident. Uh, there there was a, a story of that, uh, which again, there's no way of of verifying but they make good stories yeah they do make good stories i'm not sure that could ever possibly yeah. be true no uh and we have great success is is jeff on a ship his furniture looks like somewhere in a hull of a ship well yes he is yes we're on we're on our boat yes and bella thank you so much for the for the super sticker and random question from dean kovacs how well does a hammock mitigate the movement of a ship in the heavy seas Ah, oh, gee, I've never used a hammock on a ship in the heavy seas. But I mean, you have to think that the center of gravity would, uh, and then the whole idea of a hammock is to stop yeah. it from swinging around. Um, so there'd be a little bit of movement, but I don't think it'd be too bad. Well, ho- hopefully you're in a in a nice, comfortable queen king size bed <laughs> with some with some lovely comfortables and comforters and duvets to keep you warm. It is. It's. Uh, it's, it's pretty good at the moment. It's warming up here in Europe at the moment, but uh, it's still a little bit chilly in the first thing in the morning. But uh, we're, we're loving it. We've, we have got a, a lovely aft cabin uh, with a, an island bed, so we're, we're pretty comfortable. And JKD Buck 76 says, wait, you mean taking the time to learn from people who actually live up there might help? Yeah, that's yeah. true, too. Yeah. yeah. Whereas then, we, again, we're talking about the about a time when the natives weren't really quite people now, were they? Very true. Yeah. The savages, barbarians, what could they possibly know about living where they actually live? Uh, it's, it's ironic, though. The, the centuries, yeah. yes. <laughs> but I mean, as I said, I mean, Armiston was, I mean, um, he, he, the Inuit taught him so much, and that was so helpful for him to be able to, to be the first person to make it to the South Pole and uh, some of his other adventures as well. So, yeah, just. Uh, just another little bit of history. Well, I, I told you I wouldn't keep you more than two hours, and we've gone two hours and 15 minutes. My my ADHD didn't delay us too much, so <laughs> I'm happy about that. Um, I, I just really want to seriously give you a heartfelt thanks for, for first of all, letting me use your, your Batavia video and then agreeing to, to, to be on here to give us some legitimate expertise and and deeper knowledge into into these subjects it's, uh, it's been a pleasure and i i know the chat they've they've just been raving about it the entire time they've been waiting for you for you to be here we've been hyping it a bit and uh i if if you're willing we'd love to have you back to perhaps to do the the penley lifeboat disaster yeah, maybe in, in a month or yeah. so that would That'd be, be great, great. Um, everybody, again, the link is down there. Go to Retire to Float. Make sure you're subscribed to this amazing channel with, with these amazing people doing these wonderful videos. And uh, like everything they've done, <laughs> just make, get get them up there to, to let them know that uh, the YouTube life can be fun. Um, and, and again, I, I know I've said it 500 times, but thank you so much. 
Any, anything else you guys want to talk about uh, before we before we leave? Oh, no, just uh, thank you so much for the opportunity of coming on and, and uh, meeting some of the of the, your followers, and, and it's been a pleasure. And um, they, they seem uh, to be liking it. On, hope you do go along and, and see some of the other videos on Retired Afloat. We're, we're trying to update them as we, we go along. Um, as I said, those ones are from 2020. And, and, uh, and um, sometimes you go on ships and they don't allow you to uh, uh, to take the uh, the videos with you, but um, yeah. they, they consider it their property. But we're trying to get a few yeah. more and we're creating a few videos about some of our travels as well, some some tips and hip and uh, uh tricks about different places that we've been to what you can expect when you go there and, and try and make it easier for people that when they're visiting a place for the first time and i'm i'm sure you've heard stan rogers northwest passage song yeah um i'm i'm gonna nuke this so uh we're, we'll get a copyright claim from it but that's how i wanted to wrap this up again <laughs> I've, I've been a huge stan roger fans stan rogers fan since i was in college uh, I just love a good baritone and a and a, and a good a good maritime song or two. Always have, even though I grew up in in the great Utah desert. <laughs> just again, always like the songs. But uh, for, for those people that haven't heard the song, uh, I just wanted to, I'll play that out as long as YouTube will let us. Sometimes they'll actually start to look at us for a copyright claim in the middle of what we're doing, so I have to keep an eye on the stream here. But uh, we'll play you out with that. And if if I get to stick, stick around for just one second after we finish, uh, I would I would appreciate that. No problem. Uh, all right, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow when uh, Nina, Inf Nina Infinity will be my guest. We're going to be doing it at a special time, which will be 3 p.m. Eastern time, which is 4 a.m. my time. So that would be right about 8 p.m. UK time. You all figure out where you are relative to those places. Uh, and then Good Logic Joe will be on on Wednesday at the regular time. Uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. Mods, thank you for doing your thing. And chat, thank you for being amazingly uncharacteristically respectful <laughs> of the guests. <laughs> you didn't scare them off. They'll be back and we'll, we'll have dog cam and uh, maybe a little more chat at that point. Uh, all right. This is a, this is, again, this is a song by Stan Rogers about the, the search for the Northwest passage. And we'll, we'll play us out with that as long as we are, as long as we are able, as long as YouTube allows us to. Ah, uh, for just one time. I would take the Northwest Passage To find the hand of Franklin Reaching for the Beaufort Sea Tracing one warm line Through a land so wide and savage And make a Northwest Passage to the sea Westward from the Davis Strait is there, twas said to lie the sea route to the Orient for which so many died. Seeking gold and glory, leaving weathered broken bones and a long forgotten lonely cairn of stones. Ah, for just one time, I would take the Northwest Passage to find the hand of Franklin reaching for the Beaufort Sea, tracing one warm line through a land so wide and savage. And make a northwest passage to the sea. Three centuries thereafter, I take passage over land. In the footsteps of brave Kelso, where his sea of flowers began. Watching cities rise before me, then behind me sink again. This tardiest explorer driving hard across the plain. Ah, uh, for just one time, I would take the Northwest Passage to find the hand of Franklin reaching for the Beaufort Sea. 
tracing one warm line through a land so wide and savage and make a northwest passage to the sea. And through the night behind the wheel, the mileage clicking west, I think upon Mackenzie, David Thompson, and the rest, who cracked the mountain ramparts and did show a path for me to race the roaring Fraser to the sea. Ah, for just one time, I would take the Northwest Passage to find the hand of Franklin reaching for the Beaufort Sea, tracing one warm line through a land so wide and savage and make a northwest passage to the sea. How then am I so different from the first men through this way? Like them, I left a settled life, I threw it all away. To seek a northwest passage at the call of many men, to find there but the road back home again. Ah, for just one time, I would take the Northwest Passage to find the hand of Franklin reaching for the Beaufort Sea, tracing one warm line through a land so wide and savage, and make a northwest passage to the sea.